Hello everyone, we hope you're all doing very well. Today for another interview, and this one promises to be a bit of a belter. We've got with us here today a real actual life F-14, Tomcat, Rio, and Top Gun instructor, which is pretty cool. We've got Dave Bio Baronic here. Hello, Dave. Hi, Cap. Thanks for having me here today. Yeah, no, my pleasure. And we've also got uh, Dave or Bio's uh, friend here, Erin, that's going to add a little bit. Hello, Erin. Hey, Cap. Nice to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise. Now, I think we should start just by getting to know Bio a bit. Bio, could you please just take your time and tell us a bit about your career? So, you know, how you got into uh, in the service to begin with to the end of your career, please. Yeah, I sure will. Uh, we have like four hours for me to go through this, right? <laughs> That's what usually happens. <laughs> okay, I, uh, I'll give you the quick version. Mm. Uh, when I was about 10 to 12 years old, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And so that was my goal that I set. So in the US, and, and then I didn't know, care if I was gonna go Air Force or Navy for a while. And then I finally selected Navy. <clears throat> and then I went to uh, Navy ROTC in college because you had to have a college degree to be uh, a naval officer and a pilot. So while I was in college, my eyesight went bad. And there was, this was in the uh, mid seventies. Mm -hmm. So there was no way I could be a pilot. You have to have 20, 20 vision to be a pilot. So I was uh, distressed for a little while. I, uh, then I, but then I thought about it and I came up with being a Rio, a backseater in the F-14 Tomcat. I wouldn't be able to fly the plane, but I'd still be in fighters. So that's how I got to, uh, to that stage of being a Rio. I, uh, as soon as I graduated, I went to Pensacola for flight training in 1979. In 1980, I went to the F-14 RAG the F-14 training squadron. And in 1981, I joined my first fleet squadron, VF-24. So I was with VF-24 from 81 to 84. Uh, then I became a Top Gun instructor. I was a Top Gun instructor from 1984 to 87. Uh, then I went back to an F-14 squadron, VF-2, 1987 to 90. Then I did six years of staff jobs not what I wanted to do, but that's the way the Navy, uh, that's what the Navy wanted to do with me. And then uh, in 1996, I went back for a short refresher tour at uh, the F-14 RAG. And then I joined VF-211 as the uh, XO and CO. So I was the commanding officer of VF-211 in 1997 and 98. And then I served one more year and I retired in 1999 with 20 years of service. How's that? Good. You know what? The only thing... The worst thing about interviewing you, you guys, is how it makes me how much I've wasted my life. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> these amazing careers that you guys, I just think, how the hell have they done that? That's amazing. Cap, I was very fortunate that I knew what I wanted to do, and I per pursued it, and I was able to do it, and I did it. So, I mean, I count myself fortunate like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it is a fact in life that a lot of people just don't go, you know, they have to go and work at a computer every day and not do what they want to do. And you indeed are a lucky one. And But your attitude's, you know, top notch about it. I think it's, I think it's fantastic. As well as that, um, we can talk a little bit about being an author because you've written books. And we can have a look at your latest one. But please tell us a little, little bit about that. Okay, when I uh, when I retired from the Navy in 1999, I I uh, was got a job with a friend who owned a small company, and I was an IT project manager, information technology. Uh, it was it was eye opening. It was kind of fun, uh, but I missed flying. And uh, after about a year, about a year after I retired, so sometime in 2000, I remember driving home from work, and I was thinking. I'm going to write a magazine article about what it was like making the Top Gun movie. Cause this was about 15 years after the movie came out almost. And after just a moment, I said, no, I'm going to write a book. So I went home, I pitched it to my wife, you know, that's my first pitch. And she goes, Oh, that's a good idea. I think you should do that. So that's when I started. I mean, just from that mm -hmm. thought uh, is when I started writing uh, my first book and it, it took, it took a few years to write it and it was a lot of fun to write. Uh, then it took a few more years to find a literary agent and then get it configured for publication. And uh, Top Gun Days, my first book, came out in uh, 2010. And then I wrote Before Top Gun Days, which uh, gives the lead up to Top Gun Days. And most recently, I've written uh, Tomcat Rio, which just came out this year. 
Roger, and I have no doubt that a lot of the guys that are watching this already know of you. Uh, but uh, regards, uh, quickly before we jump into the viewers' questions, we talk a little bit about your book. I'm going to go to a website here set up by Aaron. Aaron, uh, because I want to, hear, want to hear from you as well. What I've done is I've linked now to the <laughs> tomcatrio.com forward slash Grim Reapers uh, web page here. Could you tell us a little bit about this, please? Sure, Cap. So um, what Bayer and I decided to do for this interview was um, to run a competition so that um, any of your uh, fans could join and have the opportunity to win an autographed hard copy, uh, uh, hardback copy of Bio's book. So um, if you go to tomcatrio.com forward slash Grim Reapers, um, you can put your details in there, your name and your email address. You'll go into the draw. Um, we'll draw the competition prize on the 22nd of October this year. Uh, it'll be a random draw. I will probably record it, just to prove it. Um, <laughs> and the winner will be emailed and we'll say, you know, what's your address and what would you like bio to write in the book? And uh, once that's done, it'll be sent out. Um, the other thing we're doing is um, when you put your entry in, we'll actually send you the first three chapters of bio's book, uh, which is a good, great way to get started with it. Mm -hmm. And um, also some of Bio's great photos. We've put a few in there just to give you a bit of a tease because Bio has a, a great reputation mm -hmm. as um, an, an amazing aviation photographer that he picked up over the years. So we'll give you a few introductions there. And then lastly, we'll send you some more um, links to check out some of his articles and videos that he's had published. He's quite a prolific author, obviously, mm -hmm. and has done lots of interviews. So we'll send you some of those that we think you'll enjoy the most over a, probably a one to two week period. Roger, and thank you for sorting that out. And two things that right. I've got from that is, uh, first of all, well, I look forward to, to reading the book, obviously, and by the looks of it, and when uh, Bio held it up, I can also use it for bashing burglars if they try and come in. It's a, it's a good, solid, a good, solid size, isn't it? Uh, which we this like. is a substantial book. It's bigger than my previous books. In fact, um, I asked the publisher to use bigger paper so they can make the pictures bigger, and I was surprised when I saw it. Uh, it turned mm. out well. But yes, it is very substantial. It should slow down burglars, uh, although that's not a guarantee. <laughs> First. Uh, also, uh, the other thing, I was speaking to Bio just before we turned the camera on, and he was looking at some pictures uh, that he had taken, and we're probably going to get into this at some point in the interview. And like almost all of them I've seen, and even some of them we used just as backdrops and stuff in the Grim Reapers, and we had no idea where they came from, but they are from and or of uh, Bio. Give us a quick snapshot there. Okay, this one right here, uh, I took this in when I was flying, I think it was 1989, and I, that, I took that. Uh, and the reason I did that is because uh, I'm reading a tailhook magazine. I just wanted to get some squadron publicity. And at that time, we were flying a series of uh, quite boring flights out over the Indian Ocean. No threat, no training, nothing. We were just out there flying. And so uh, I thought of this idea. I set my camera up on a tripod and I clamped it to the pilot's ejection seat. And then, uh, I mean, I coordinated with my pilot to do this. And uh, then I just took the picture. And the, the mistakes I made are one, I wish I had turned the other way so you could read my name tag that I used to, you know, that we all wore. And two, I'm showing the back cover of the Tailhook magazine instead of the front cover. <laughs> But still, I sent it to the magazine and it was published. So, and, and it's come, yeah, it's taken, it's become a meme on the internet. Yeah, it really uh, has. A it's, bit. it's so funny. We've got it, that picture scattered all over our Discord, which is like our gamer social media. And we're, you never even think where it comes from. It's just, you know, a meme -y picture that's out there. So isn't that funny? Bit of history there. Mate, that makes Bio a selfie taker before smartphones. Which <laughs> there is it is. Cool, because he used a real photo, real camera. <laughs> All right, yes. yes, you do. Okay, guys, and now we're going to come to uh, the meat of the video. Now, so what we do is, rather than just me kind of faking it, basically, what we do is we get videos, as you know now, sent in from the valued viewers. Now, this had positives and negatives. Positives, you can get some really interesting stuff generally you know you've never been asked before it can also work out the other way it can be completely irrelevant and can make a bad interview but that's what we do it's up to the, the valued viewers and we'll just see how it goes these haven't been changed they're just as they are some notes written by them but that's it secondly where we come from we i know you're aware of obviously dcs you're not a dcs er like us um obviously me my guys none of us are real military pilots some of us are 
commercial pilots, but no military pilots. And and where we come from, it's it's a simulation. It's not real, but it's as best as we can get. And recently added, well, a year or so added, is the F-14, which really changed everything because you've got that real dynamics between a pilot in the front doing the pilot stuff, a Rio in the back doing Rio stuff. And not only is it about pressing the right buttons and reading the TID right, it's also about the human connection between the two. Uh, we have in game terms professional rios that fly with in game terms professional pilots they're fully trained up to do their separate things and the ones that do well interestingly are the pilot that works on a human level right with the rio and i'm sure we're going to get into this and it, it just it makes it brings a whole new thing to the game or simulator whatever you want to call it a really interesting so it's the biggest thing in the tomcat uh probably we've ever had to be honest uh love it or lump it um, and that's it. Anything from you guys before we punch on us through the viewer questions? I'm no. ready to jump into it. And a lot of the points that you made will come out as we answer these questions. I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Uh, question one. As a <clears throat> Rio, uh, what do you appreciate most from the pilot? Uh, I think I appreciated uh, candid, candid comments and, com and conversation. I don't mean social conversation, but I mean... Uh, he would let me know if he was doing something unusual, if if he thought the plane was working well, uh, you know, or was having a bunch of little problems. And he would let me know if he wanted me to do something different. But, uh, and, and that may sound kind of basic, but most pilots uh, do that. They do talk to you freely and, you know, you, you, try to work together as a crew, but it takes both guys. So it's, it's very similar to what you just said. Roger. And sorry if this is repeated on another question, but I've got to ask, just, do, are you kind of stuck with a pilot the whole for years or do you just kind of swap around every few weeks? I, I'm not sure how it works. It's months. No, in the, uh, all the squadrons I was in, it was very similar. So I was in three squadrons and, and the, uh, the, this was similar. You are assigned a, a baseline, you know, pilot Rio crew, they're assigned. And uh, they fly together, I would say 80% of the time that pilot and Rio fly together. And then uh, every once in a while, for a variety of reasons, you can switch, you know, switch pilot or Rio. And that was actually good because it allowed you to standardize. You know, mm -hmm. when I flew with a different pilot, uh, if I, I would get an idea from him, he'd say, oh, my Rio always does this and it helps me or whatever. Or I'd tell him, you know, oh, you're not supposed to do that. You know, works both ways. Um, but flying together with the same guy allows you to build good crew coordination. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a good idea. Roger. I guess that was kind of perfected from the early days of the F4 Phantom and stuff like that. When you've got that, you've got that back and forwards that you need to have. Interesting. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I, I interviewed a, a Phantom pilot uh, at length. Uh, this was Dave Batson, who got the, uh, the Navy second kill in Vietnam. Mm. And he said that uh, his Rio, he had flown with his Rio back then. He flew with that guy, I think, for about two years. Wow. Uh, in the squadrons I was in, it usually changed after about uh, six months to a year. Roger. Okay. Right. And we go to the opposite side. What do you, without trying to upset someone, what do you dislike most from a pilot? Uh, I, I didn't fly with any pilots that, I, that had any really bad habits. But I will say something, and, and it's something I got from uh, watching DCS. And it was... Uh, uh, so I've watched a little bit of DCS videos and I saw a pilot say to a Rio, he told him what radar mode to use. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I mean, maybe the Rio is brand new. Maybe that was fine. I don't have a lot of context, mm -hmm. but, but the pilot has his cockpit and I have my cockpit and, you know, we're both trained professionals. And so you, he, you don't want the pilot to tell you, try to tell you your job. And uh, similarly, uh, he doesn't want you to tell him his job. It's a really interesting point you've struck on there. And I don't know the word to explain this, but it's it's who has the authority in a certain situation. Because when I fly, I, I unfortunately, I can't fly the Tomcat at the moment in DCS. There's a very small bug, and I hope it'll get fixed soon. But in the multiplayer <laughs> games, unfortunately, we can't do it. It's just how it is. Uh, so I have to fly other planes, so be it. Uh, but the, the, the biggest problem I always had, if I was the pilot or the Rio, would be Okay, a uh, situation has arisen, uh, uh, MIGs ahead, it's at a certain range, blah, 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 here's the situation. 
who's actually got control at that point? Is it the is it the is it the pilot or, or the guy? So we have a strict rule, and this is, I'm sure this is unrealistic, but it's just all we had. We said if the bad guy is 20 nautical miles or more, it's the Rio's problem. Okay, he's going to get he's going to get the radar, every, the locks sorted, fire the missiles. That if it's within 20 miles, it becomes a pilot's problem. The Rio just hands off, you know, hands off the control. Uh, otherwise, you're both fighting each other. Anything interesting thing to say about that in real life? Yes, Cap, and that is, uh, that's, that's a totally valid comment. And I talk about that in Top Gun days. I talk about how the, the pilot that I flew with in the Top Gun uh, class, he and I uh, went over this in detail, the handoff. And I, the Rio was responsible for, for driving the plane, even though I didn't physically, couldn't fly the plane. I directed the aircraft. I directed our section because you're in a flight of two. Uh, so in addition to running the radar, I've got to do the thinking about what we're supposed to be doing and stuff. Uh, and then the handoff uh, back then was uh, was more like uh, uh, 12 miles, roughly. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, was was I went through the Top Gun class in 1982. The, the bandits that we were facing, the simulator bandits, uh, had very few had forward quarter missiles. Mm -hmm. And we were using AIM-7s. Mm -hmm. So that's why we did the handoff in, at, at around 12 miles because we were setting up for the, uh, mm -hmm. the within visual range fight. Um, now, uh, things are going to be different with, you know, the advent of uh, fourth generation fighters uh, and, and the F-18s using uh, AMRAMs, but also the F-14s used Phoenix uh, mm -hmm. starting in the mid to late 1980s. So, so it is something that is, uh, it's a valid point of crew concept. But I also, I don't remember it being an issue. And part of it is, I guess, because, you know, we all went to the F-14 RAG for almost a year before we joined our squadron. And so you you deal with all these things. Mm. That's really interesting. And I, I promised we wouldn't segue off, and but we're doing it. And that's just how it is. Um, you, you mentioned stuff about that and, and the advent of the AIM-54. And in DCS, DCS is a big thing. I know for some people it's just always oh, a little video game it's a big thing hundreds of thousands of people doing it and we take it like you know these guys doing it 10 hours a day like me they take it super seriously and it becomes a job and so it is quite serious to us and so that now as soon as the tomcat came out the balance of power changed you've got all these different aircraft you know you've got 38 <laughs> different aircraft in dcs and they manipulate with each other and they all fit in in like a a, um, a pecking order we'd say in this country i don't know if you say that uh, uh, and things would kind of balance out then the 14 came in First plane, obviously with long-range missiles, with a decent data link, with an amazing Org Nine radar. Uh, even with, even compared to the modern planes, and the balance of power suddenly shifted. The old-style missions aren't weren't possible, where you could have planes coming in, kind of, uh, 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 to get to get onto target because because this beast of a plane can cover such a big area with its amazing situational awareness and its missiles. Are the miss? I mean. Whether the missiles are realistic or not, I haven't got a clue. I don't suppose anyone could ever tell you that. And I'm talking about the AIM-54. Um, but in and, and, and again, in real life, they were, I guess, never really used in anger per se. But in DCS, they are. They're being flung out at a rate of knots. And you can have just one little Tomcat controlling a 100-mile radius area. And, and, and they're so different to us. It's made such a difference. Uh, for good or for bad, you know, this depends which side of the missile you're on, I suppose. Um, that's anyway. <laughs> you don't so, want to be on the receiving not really, end. You don't, you know. Uh, it's, it's changed the balance about. And I'm sure every DCS that's in will be talking to it, at the, uh, will be agreeing, nodding their head. It's changed the battlefield massively. Uh, and we've had to get whole new tactics to get around it. Um, but that's just how it is. Um, anyway, sorry, I had to put that out there. Let's blast on. Well, sorry, go ahead. Do you, do you want me to tell you how that is different from the real world? Absolutely. Well, I understand. Okay. I presumably, I'm going to. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'm going to make a guess that in DCS you don't have any kinds of ROE restrictions. It's either a blue guy or a red guy. You know automatically if it's a blue guy, red guy, fire the missile. In real life, I'm guessing it's not that simple. That was that was my first thought. It's uh, and it's positive ID, mm. uh, and and uh, some aircraft have. Uh, adequate built-in systems where they can get a positive ID to satisfy uh, weapons release. The F-14A with the AUG-9 that I flew did not have that. And so we relied on an, a third party to, uh, you know, being we're the first party that targets the second party. We relied on an external source to tell us uh, that was hostile uh, unless we visually mm -hmm. identified them. And that, that destroyed, you know, that mm -hmm. put, takes a Phoenix out of it. Okay. So one is positive identification is hostile Two, the AUG-9 
I hate to say it, but over land, the AUG-9 provided false targets sometimes. Oh. And so, and so uh, I mean, sometimes I would be flying and I would see something and I'd go, that's a beautiful target. And then it would disappear and it wouldn't be where the target was. So you can't just say, oh, there's a symbol on my track on my TID, mm -hmm. Fox 3. You can't just do that because it could be, you know, you got to validate that it's a target. Uh, but the biggest thing is identifying them. <clears throat> so the yeah, so you're really into the difference between real life, which has problems, and a simulator where everything's in a vacuum, everything's perfectly clean. Now some of this stuff is is modelled, but a lot of it isn't. So for instance, everything in terms of IFF in DTS is magic IFF. Everyone knows who's goody on who's baddie, and I hope I hope it stays that way. It's really nice. Uh, it's really, <laughs> if, if, if that gets realistic, there's going to be a lot of problems because we're not trained pilots. None of us are. And uh, yeah. Well, Cap, you guys enjoy it. I mean, you're yeah. doing a nice job. I've watched videos that uh, guys are challenging themselves through various rules and scenarios and stuff. Uh, enjoy it. And guys are trying to get better. That's good. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is we, we were reenacting the, sorry if I get this date wrong, I think it was the 1981 Gulf of Citra incident. Um, I think it was that. That's true. And, 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 and you had these two lovely big tom cats against a couple of um, uh, floggers or fitters. Or fitters, right? Fitters. Yeah. And, um, and, and you know, uh, with their whopping great phoenixes, they could have blasted missiles at 60 miles and, and killed them in no problem, but they weren't allowed to. ROE meant that I think they had to be fired upon first. So all of a sudden, true. you've got this massive, long range, hyper technical F 14 that's reduced to an expensive dogfighter. Uh, because you can use those missiles, where again in DCS you shoot anything. A massive difference there with the real life rules of actually being able to shoot humans down and not. Yes. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, right, uh, let's blast on to number four. And I don't fully understand this, but I'm sure you do. Oddest Top Gun student routines you have seen? You know, I left that on there, and, and for, the, uh, for your audience, I mean, we, mm. we edited this a little bit, but I mm. left that on there because. Uh, I think the person is talking about, you know, for example, in American baseball, you see a baseball a, a bat, a player when he gets up to bat. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he bats the, the, the bat on the ground, you know, three times and then gets his, mm -hmm. in his stance. But the uh, Top Gun students, uh, I don't recall anything that they did unusual. They were young, aggressive, confident, um, you know, fighter pilots in Rios. Mm -hmm. And they were ready to go out there and fly. Mantra. Okay. Um, question five, any pilots you really, really miss flying with? Oh, yes. There were a couple of guys that, uh, and, and I mentioned a lot of them in these books. Um, I miss flying with all those guys. I had a lot of great pilots that I flew with. Uh, there were a few that I didn't enjoy too much, but, but maybe there were some pilots that didn't like flying with me. I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine, but it's possible. No job. And then a lot of times we also, I mean, I miss uh, squadron life. If anybody's wondering about that, um, and I tried to give a hint of that in the books, but it, it was great being in a squadron, um, be, being a member of that club, you know. Marjo, when you watch kind of historical documentaries about not pilots necessary, but ground troops, infantry, and they say when they're not necessarily in action, but when they're active, they say the bonds they make with the guys, you know, in their platoon, in their fire team, whatever, are the strongest bonds they ever make, um, especially in wartime for, I don't really know why. It's just, you know, when you're put in massive danger and your life, you're literally putting in someone's hand, you build this amazing bond. Is there any relevance to that with the crew of a, oh, yeah. an aircraft? Oh, yes. I... Uh... I still get together with uh, pilots from my first squadron, and that's almost, and actually I knew them in training, and that's going back 40 years. And we still enjoy getting together, uh, a few guys that, are, uh, that happen to live near me, and I stay in touch with them on email and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's true. Awesome. I think it's uh, years of shared experiences, uh, long deployments and stuff, but, but also, I mean, maybe also it's like how we got into that situation. Maybe we had something fundamental, similar mm -hmm similar fundamentally similar about us although i also have to say and i make this point in uh, i mean i keep referring to the books but a squadron is not a collection of clones i mean it's got a big variety of people there's tall people short people skinny people heavier people um you know very smart not so smart i mean everything Mojo. 
Okay, very good. Um, let's move on to number six. Uh, I should say this has been probably our most popular so far. We've had 56 questions. I think that might have even been trimmed. I'm not sure. So this is a, we've, got, we've got a lot to get through. Number six. Are Rios trained as pilots first and then transfer to Rio? Is it a choice that you get to make? Uh, can you choose to fly your pilot? Oh, sorry. Can you choose which pilot to fly with? And that's from Ventura. Okay, and I will. Uh, I think I've answered most of these uh, in my in my mm. earlier remarks, and th that's mm. from reading this question. That's what led me to say some of those things. But I'll quickly go over it. Are Rios trained as pilots first and then transferred to Rio? That's a simple answer. No, uh, the the Navy trains. When I came in, Rio training took about ten months, and pilot training took uh, about one and a half to two years. And then the pilot, and that was separate tracks. And then they came together in the F-14 training squadron. And then it took the same time because, uh, because you learn everything about the plane. Uh, it's a choice that you make. I think, I think most Rios are there because they don't have the eyesight to be pilots. <laughs> uh, but there, there may be some Rios that had 20-20 vision. And then also after pilots, after they get qualified, their eyesight can deteriorate some and they can continue to be a pilot um, up to a limit. And then choosing the pilot that you fly with, uh, the only person who can do that is the squadron commander um, because the squadron commander makes the decision. He assigns the pilot in Rio cruise. Uh, that was in my experience. Marjorie, I just realized I got to question eight and I've completely forgot to bring Aaron in. Aaron, uh, do you want to do some questions? Because I promised Aaron's a good friend of uh, bio and I promised we'd share the questions between us equally to, so he doesn't just sure. sit there, sit on his hands. And I, you know what I'm like, once I start, I can't stop. So you belt away with question eight onwards. Let's see how far we get on. Sure, no worries. Um, actually, I'm going to tweak this question slightly um, and you'll so know why in a minute. So the question is, did you ever work with the British military? And I would add just purely from an Australian perspective, do you ever work with any of the Aussies as well? Hmm. And the answer to both of those is no, sadly. I will tell you why. For the British, it's uh, because I was, a, uh, I was on a Pacific deploying squadrons for, through uh, all three of my squadron tours. So I did not deploy it through into the Atlantic, Mediterranean or anything. So I never operated near England. Um, in terms of the Australians, we just didn't fly against them uh, back then, uh, as my recollection. Some of the countries that I flew uh, with in terms of exercises uh, that I can say, actually Thailand is one that uh, we flew against uh, that, that didn't mind us saying that. And this was back in the 1980s. Uh, oh, and the French. The French uh, were, they had an aircraft carrier deployed in the Indian Ocean and we uh, fought against them sometimes. And we also trained with some other countries uh, in, in the Middle East. Cool. Most Back of them to were you. good too. Back to you, Cap. Oh, right. Uh, right. Cooking on number nine. Um, when the Navy transitioned to single seat strike fighter aircraft with the uh, newer automation technology, what career path did F-14 Rios have open for them? Hmm, how interesting. Pilot training, GCI ATC, Red Air, opposition, uh, ship anti-air defences. A colleague commissioned as a US MC FA-18D slash F Wizzo, uh, but never, I wonder who that is, uh, but never deployed because she said the single seat F-18CE had more gas and could carry more payload. So one thing about uh, when the F-14 was decommissioned, the F-14 was decommissioned in 2006, and uh, they started to taper down, of course, uh, in the years leading up to that. Uh, most of the Rios had the option to become Wizzos in F-18Fs because the, the current Navy carrier air wing has three single-seat F-18E squadrons and one two-seat F-18F squadron. And then also it has uh, F-18, uh, uh, EF-18s, which is the uh, Growler, uh, electronic warfare. And so uh, most Rios got the option to, to become Wizzos. I would say that a few of them, uh, a few of them may have been qualified to, for pilot transition. And then others uh, probably were offered uh, uh, the chance to go to other communities, such as the E-2 or other jobs in the Navy. 
but I think the Navy tried to keep most of them in aviation. Roger, just before Aaron jumps in, one thing I keep meaning to ask every pilot, and I keep forgetting, you'd mentioned about uh, pilots not being able to do their job because of their eyesight. Nowadays, you can have kind of like permanent laser treatment and stuff. Just for you, purely for my interest, is that is is that does that work nowadays? Do do you allowed to do that? I had laser. I had uh, when I retired. I my wife and I both had laser. Yeah. And so it works. But uh, the also I understand and and I have specifically not become an expert on this, but the U.S. military does accept uh, some type of mm. eye surgery, I, as I understand it. And then you can you can get it um, and be 2020 and be a pilot. Mm. Great. Aaron. Um, just quickly, Bio, before we go on to my question, you, you mentioned you have one squadron of um, F-18Fs. I, I didn't even know that. What did they have them there for? Because obviously they're two-seaters. Were they all training purposes or were they all growlers? What was the reasoning for it? No, the, uh, this is the current carrier air wing right now has a squadron of two-seat Super Hornets, mm -hmm. one squadron of two-seaters, and three squadrons of single-seaters. Now, there's actually, uh, I, heard, uh, I heard rumblings. Um, there's a discussion about how to split up missions and um, all kinds of things like that. Um, so it, it's not settled business right now because um, as I understand it, and, and I am not the expert on this, I, don't, I, don't, I consciously don't follow the policy or try to be an expert on this, but I think the F-18E and the F-18F have roughly basically similar capabilities. Um, so, I think there's a big discussion uh, throughout the Navy fighter, strike fighter community about this. Mm. Cool. Okay, so uh, my next question is, while in, and this is something I've actually made many to ask you for ages, but while in air-to-air -air combat, when your pilot is doing flight maneuvers and pulling Gs, how hard does it become to do your job? When you're in control, you obviously know where the, how the plane's going to move and you can preemptively brace against it. So how jarring are unexpected movements or are you given a heads up? Well, uh, first thing is uh, there's no heads up. When you're in a, uh, in a real engagement, uh, the pilot is, you know, very dynamic. He's trying to, uh, to uh, uh, attack uh, one airplane and he's also, you know, conscious of other airplanes. Uh, he's conscious of them, he's tracking them, and I'm tracking them also. And, and it's very dynamic in terms of, you know, which ones do you have and who do you see and all that. Um, so there's no heads up. But also, I don't recall uh, too much difficulty getting the job done. You know, uh, you've, got, you've got an ACM handle, and a lot of time the Rio reaches up and grabs onto that handle, which is on top of the DDD. And then he turns around and looks, you know, at a guy behind him, you know, switches hands and all that, braces against the canopy rail. Uh, you just get the job done. If you have to um, move your hands to, to change radar modes or activate one of the dogfight modes or launch chaff, you do it. Uh, I think sometimes maybe your helmet bounces off the uh, canopy a little bit, but I don't even recall that happening very much. It's just uh, you, you're just... Uh, braced and ready to deal with all that cool okay yeah. back to you cap just to follow on to uh, follow on to that same question in our simulator when we do get into acm into a knife fight then the pilot obviously does the flying the rio purely becomes if you like a second set of eyes and it becomes a spotter and feeds back information about where the bandit is and so on is that true in in the real machine or all the other things that you'll be doing uh, that's that's one of the main Rio duties in an engagement is defensive lookout. But the Rio also uh, continues, and I did this to have uh, you know, and I always call these co-pilot type duties. If you're in a training area, you're watching area boundaries, uh, you're you're watching airspeed, you're watching altitude, you're watching fuel, you're backing the pilot up on all these things. Um, I personally, I did not tell the pilot how to fly the plane. Uh, I actually remember one time I said that to uh, one of my pilots. I said, you know, get the nose down or something like that. And as soon as the engagement ended, he said, don't ever tell me how to fly mm. the plane. <laughs> <laughs> now, but, now, these were fleet pilots I was dealing with. It's probably different when you have a RAG instructor Rio and a pilot under training 
he might appreciate some comments uh, at that stage. Roger. Okay, well, let's punch on with number 11. Some negative things. What are the most frustrating things about the Tomcat in, quality, in terms of quality of life? Like, do the seats suck? Is the ride rough? Does the air conditioning break? That kind of stuff. Okay, so those are good examples. Uh, the, the, I think the biggest thing that everyone commented on was the air conditioner was very loud. Uh, if you look at any uh, handheld cockpit videos where there was no no comm plugged into the camera, uh, you'll hear a roaring sound and that's the air conditioner. Of course, we had our helmets on, so uh, most of the time we couldn't hear it very much. Um, the seat was uh, relatively comfortable. I mean, it wasn't cushy, but it was pretty comfortable. And in fact, I, uh, I wrote about that in my, my new book, Tomcat Rio. I was on a, a flight that lasted more than seven hours one time. And even though the seat was pretty comfortable, a couple of times I ran the seat all the way to the bottom. I unstrapped my lap belt and I stood on the seat cushion just to, <laughs> just to move after sitting there for seven hours. Uh, the cockpit had, uh, it was roomy. Um, you know, I used to carry a, a helmet bag and there was, there was a lot of room in the cockpit. Uh, in terms of the rough ride, that brings up something that I, I always, or I've occasionally commented about in the movie Top Gun. In the movie, in the movie Top Gun, it looks like these guys are on like a, a covered wagon rolling down a rutted, <laughs> you know, trail. Because every time they're in the plane, it's jumping or, or roll, jumbling like that. Uh, I think that is trying to recreate one to give you the sense of motion. Mm -hmm. And the only time that Tomcat did anything like that was when it was in Buffett uh, uh, during hard turns during an engagement. Most of the time, the ride was very smooth. So I did not have a lot of uh, creature comfort complaints. Watch out. Okay, very good. I've heard some very different answers with other aircraft, but that's interesting. Uh, Aaron. Oh, really? Are you, have you heard people complain there, Yeah, Kat? Yeah, so we were talking to, um, well, I haven't prepared anything this, but I remember the Hornet pilot um, was always complaining about his, his lack of air conditioning, as in it got really hot in there. Uh, this was an Australian guy, so I guess it's going to be, you know, extra hot o over there. But his, his biggest... Bloody Aussies always whinging. <laughs> his biggest memory was how hot and how every time he got out of the cockpit, it was like, you know, he was absolutely destroyed from the heat and the aeroplane's terrible attempt at trying to cool him down. And it's just something that stuck in my mind. Okay. Well, I will say that I flew the... Uh, I mean, I'm, I, w I flew in F-14s in the Persian Gulf and it was, you know, 110 mm -hmm. degrees outside or whatever, but the F-14 had very good air conditioning mm -hmm. and um, even on the deck. And, the, you know, it's just a question of the pilot dialing it down or dialing it up. The pilot had the AC controls. The mm -hmm. Rio did not have air conditioning controls. Mm. That could make for an interesting day, Z, uh, <laughs> flying. You two weren't getting on. <laughs> yeah, well, and but Aaron, like you, I mean, you just said the Aussies are whinging. I know you're kidding, but I did not want to be one of those complaining Rios. Hey, could you make it cooler in here? Could you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I tried to be tolerant. Sounds good. Alrighty. So, next question: What unique limitations does the Org Nine have, and how did you overcome them? Well, this, this is, uh, you may want to cut that out. I don't know. <laughs> the AUG-9 limitations, uh, it, it showed false targets, even in the automatic modes, track wall scan, uh, mainly track wall scan. Track wall scan was a, uh, a great radar mode. It had a lot of versatility, provided track quality data on multiple targets at all ranges, you know, short range to long range. But sometimes, uh, over land especially, it would show a false target. So you'd see something pop up, it would look really good, and it would just be, you know, after a few seconds, it would go away. So that made me a little bit hesitant sometimes uh, when I was evaluating the spatial picture. Um, you know, the AUG-9 was designed in the 1960s. It was designed to do certain things. It had a large antenna, it had a lot of power out, it had different modes, different channels, and all kinds of good things like that, but they they could not automate uh, or they couldn't apply um, like a lot of computer processing that, that they didn't have. Uh, so it, it had its flaws. 
I think a lot of these were were uh, corrected in the uh, F-14D radar when they uh, took like the best features of the AUG-9 and I think the F-15 radar. Uh, I'm not going to say the names because I don't remember them just right now. And they, they updated a lot of the uh, AUG-9's features with modern uh, processing. Did these false returns, did anyone ever, ever investigate what was causing these false returns? Were they like, I don't know, objects on the ground, or was it literally just creating them out of thin air? Uh, it's probably, uh, uh, one, it was just a fact of life. So nobody looked into, uh, yeah, and there weren't a lot of them. But you just had to be careful because, you know, there were occasional false returns mm -hmm. in, in trackwall scan. No, it's just uh, a known, you know, the, the uh, Doppler filters to filter out noise, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, either missed some or had a computer update rate problem or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in, if you're operating in pulse search, which is the... Uh, like the main radar mode that people would think about where, you know, sweeps back and forth and you see blobs for clouds and mountains and all. You knew that you were going to see a lot of trash on the scope because everything that had a physical property would basically show up on your pulse search scope. Uh, but in, in track wall scan, you're not supposed to get very much, very much false targets. So very interesting. Very interesting. We had some. Like I said before, we're just lucky we have the simulated version and we, we don't have false returns. We have only see what's actually there. But it's it's interesting to see the difference in real life to that. Well, and over water, my recollection, over water, the, uh, the AUG-9 was, was pretty clean, even in track wall scan. Mm. Uh, but, you know, we didn't fight a lot of... Uh, I mean, we did, some, we did a lot of training out over the Pacific off San Diego, but uh, uh, that's probably not where you're going to do a lot of MiG fighting. My job. Hmm. Unless you're filming a movie and it's MiG 28s and they come out. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that leads us, that segues us beautifully onto the next question, guys. Number 14. What was the educational environment like at Top Gun? And we should, we should before we go any further, we should, you were involved in two Top Guns. You were involved in the real Top Gun, you know, the, 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 the real training scenario, and in the 1986 Tom Cruise movie, right? Um, yes. But in terms of uh, just this question, uh, sorry, what was the educational environment like at Top Gun, so the real one, uh, time spent in class slash brief versus flight time, that sort of stuff? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. And I'll answer uh, based on when I was there as a student and instructor in the mid-1980s. And I'll compare that a little bit to what has, uh, how, how it is now as I understand it. Um, back in the 1980s, we flew almost exclusively uh, daytime. Uh, as I was leaving, they were just starting to introduce a very con controlled nighttime flight. Uh, also, back in the 1980s, the class was five weeks long, and it was normally Monday through Friday. Uh, so occasionally, we would fly on a Saturday uh, if we had bad weather and needed to make up some flights or whatever, but mostly uh, five days a week. So pretty gentlemanly hours. Now, the new instructor, so behind the scenes, a new instructor would work seven days a week, 14, 15 hours a day or more to, to develop his lecture. But, but that didn't affect the class and that didn't affect most of the staff. That was, you know, a personal effort. Okay, so uh, the first day was uh, all lectures. Then the next day, I believe almost everyone did their first flight. And then as the five-week class progressed, uh, many days you would have uh, one or two lectures in the morning and then uh, two or three flights after that. So for the, uh, on a day, say you had a lecture in the morning and uh, three flights during the day, you would, you would complete your lecture, which might be an hour to two hours. You'd go for a flight brief, and the flight brief was um, moderately detailed, uh, and in fact, there's a picture in my book, uh, Top Gun Days, that shows me briefing a class, and I've got the uh, whiteboard behind me with the flight briefing written up on it, and you can see there's a lot of space. So I gave out a fair amount of information, but I did not fill the board. And, and there's a reason I'm telling you all these little details. 
So the flight brief probably lasted uh, 30 minutes. It included some tactical considerations and things like that, but I would not, I would not re-deliver the lecture. Then everybody broke up. The fighters could brief themselves. The bandits would go into a, a dedicated uh, bandit brief. Then we'd all launch. We'd go flying. A flight would last an uh, hour and 15 minutes, maybe. You'd land. You would, uh, and the debrief, depending on what time of day it was, uh, the debrief would go, you know, 40 minutes to an hour. It was pretty thorough. Uh, and then, though, if you had no, no events later or if it was the last event of the day, the debrief could go even longer, especially if there were some issues that needed to be covered. Um, the main thing that I'm going to say about those debriefs, again, they were thorough. Uh, they were objective. So if the fighters had a terrible day, they would be told they had a terrible day, but they wouldn't say, you screwed up. It would be, you know, so what did the F-14s, what were the F-14s thinking? Why did the F-14s do this? Whatever. So it was, it was third person to try, so you wouldn't, um, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't totally alienate them and make them shut down out of defensiveness. So in the Top Gun movie, one of the things I quite specifically remember is when they're they're doing the um, the debriefs, and they have that very clunky looking graphical um, um, replay of everything, which which just looked like an eighteen sixties version of track uh, track view or whatever it's called, tack view. Sorry, was it that was that what you guys used, or was that just something they cobbled together? Aaron, that was the ACMI or tax range that was developed around 1970 by Cubit Corporation. And at the time, it was eye-watering. <laughs> it was uh, one of the recommendations from the, uh, from the uh, ALT report. It was, uh, I mean, it, it was incredible. It was an extremely valuable debriefing tool. We didn't, we didn't use it as a crutch because, and, and they told us as a new instructor, and, and all instructors adhered to this, you use that as an aid to your debrief, but the lead instructor is responsible for reconstruction, et cetera. So the Top Gun instructor runs a debrief and he runs the uh, replay to support it. But at the time, uh, when I was there in the mid 1980s, that was still very cool. Uh, and, and thinking that it had been around since, you know, the early 70s. So, uh, I'm not sure what the display looks like now. I haven't seen the tax range in a long time. I know they still use the system. Mm -hmm. One of the good things about the uh, that clunky display, yeah, it looks like a first generation computer graphics thing, uh, but but it accurately shows the outlines of the aircraft and their size, and um, you don't get any distraction from you know it, it's like the benefit of a black and white photo. It shows the subject without a bunch of color distraction. Mm. I mean, that's just an analogy. So, so the tax range, it showed the terrain, you know, in, in like, uh, what do they call it? Wire? Wireframe. Yeah, wireframe, thank you. So, I mean, we, I loved it. And I think a lot of guys loved it. Mm. I, I mean, if you, anyone in DCS now is probably familiar with something they have called TacView, which is a much more modern one. Mm -hmm. I was always curious as to whether that's what you guys actually used back then or not. That was the actual debrief system that we used. And not only that, they used it uh, real-time tracking of airplanes. That was, if we were fighting over the tax range, we almost always had a controller in the trailer use, looking at that system real-time and uh, giving us uh, control. Okay, so one more thing. I'll move on quickly. Uh, when I talked about the, uh, the time in the briefing, the, the flights and everything, I think the Top Gun class now, I think it's nine weeks. I need to go online and, and look at that. Anyway, it's much longer than the five weeks we did. Uh, it's more like uh, six or seven days a week. There's, uh, there are some night events. Uh, the briefings and debriefings last longer. So everything is uh, increased in, in uh, intensity. And the main reason for that is the, uh, the threat is more challenging. And also, um, you know, American weapons are more challenging also, or more, more capable. Mm. When, we, when I was flying, the main weapons in the Top Gun class were the Sparrow and the Sidewinder. I left uh, before the Phoenix was, was used 
commonly. And so now, you know, you've got uh, everybody's got AMRAMs and Sidewinders and the threat is higher and there's surface to air threat more capable and all that. So, OK. Cool. So um, Cap and I were talking last week uh, and we didn't get a chance to actually uh, get you to tell us a little bit about your involvement in the Top Gun movie. So I've got a question I'll ask you about that and then maybe we'll get you to tell us a little bit more about your involvement in that side of it. So someone who wrote the question, I'm assuming they don't know your background. So the question was, hi, if you've watched the Top Gun movie, how much of it made you laugh and how much of it made you cringe? Cheers. <laughs> okay, so this uh, covers my involvement. Uh, mm -hmm. That's at the top. Uh, it shows me and Rat after we got out of a MiG-28 after filming, which was, of course, an F5F, not a T-38, an F5F. And there were also three F5E single seaters that were painted black. And then at the bottom, that was uh, me and my wife and uh, Anthony Edwards Goose, because I was an instructor when they filmed the movie. So we, we read the script. We helped them work on the script. We flew the airplanes for them, um, both the MiGs and also the Top Gun class airplanes, which were our own A4 Skyhawks. And then when we went to see the movie, um, my recollection, I mean, I'll, I'll be a little bit uh, I'll be a little bit extra nice. Uh, I thought it was spectacular seeing it up on the big screen, um, hearing you know all the uh, incredible music and the uh, and the soundtrack of the engines and all that. Um, and I accepted the plot as you know it's it's not a documentary. It's a it's a, a love story and a buddy story, and it's set in the Top Gun class and in squadrons. Uh, so some things did make me cringe. Um, one, and I and I said, told some of these to uh, Tony Scott, the director. I told him face to face when I went up there to, to Paramount to uh, to help them to write dialogue. Um, I told him, Tony, the the airplanes are too close together. And he goes, Bio, it's not a documentary. <laughs> so I mean, that's so that's his term, but. Uh, when when you uh, when you're in ACM, there's 500 foot bubbles. There's all kinds of things. But in the movie, they're flying so close together, and the reason is because it looks a lot better on the screen. Uh, one of the other things that made me cringe was the um, "Never Leave Your Wingman." In the movie, that's depicted as two Tomcats flying in formation, basically, and that was not the way uh, Top Gun operated. Uh, we operated under a doctrine of mutual support, so the lead and the wingman would remain in visual uh, visual range and, and be able to support each other, but it wasn't the flying in formation thing. Um, and, I, and I told Tony Scott these, he goes, you know, bio, most of the audience won't know that. And besides, it looks good on the screen. So uh, it, it's a good movie, but um, it's got a lot of artificialities with, you know, to make it a good movie. Cool. Hmm. All right, back to you, Cap. Fascinating to get your view on that. I really had no idea which way you, you were going to go with that, so that's interesting. Um, oh, Cap, you know, it would be very easy to sit here and enumerate yeah. all the flaws in the movie. Mm -hmm. And there's extensive lists online. I've looked at them myself, and and uh, but but that's not the point. I mean, that would get tedious. Uh, mm -hmm. Although, if if you want to do that, I'll. <laughs> It's fun to just go over all the flaws. Well, you the know? thing is, if you make it, I've, I'm not a pilot, as you well know, but since I've learned, a, you know, a decent amount about aviation, I just cannot watch aviation Hollywood movies anymore because you just sit there spotting all the. I now sit there spotting all the problems. It kind of ruins it for you in a way. I, I like. I'd like to be naive again. And <laughs> I mean, you're right though. Oh, I, you're right though, because what you, what you were kind of saying there is, if you made, if they'd made it realistic, it would have been boring to the average viewer, who you well, know. I, yeah, I wrote in my uh, I wrote in in a book. I said nobody wants to uh, watch a Top Gun instructor practicing his lecture to a room full of empty chairs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, or we used to we used to sit around and when I again this is when I was there. I don't know what it's like now, but we would sit in the ready room, and you'd get three or four guys would eat lunch at the same time. They'd bring their brown bags in, eat lunch, and talk about cars or whatever. But it you know that's it's real life, normal humans. My job. So. Okay. 
Right. Doesn't yeah. make for an exciting movie. No, exactly, no. exactly. So, yeah, fair enough. Right, let's push on, guys. Uh, I'm sure you've got lots of stories that we'd love to uh, talk about and we'd love to hear, but do you have a particular st- operational deployment story that you'd like to talk about? Well, my, uh, my first four deployments were all in the 1980s, and they were all uh, through the Pacific into the Indian Ocean. And uh, on my first couple of deployments, we were aware uh, they were they were after the uh, Iranian hostage crisis. So Iran was uh, America's, you know, geopolitical threat in the area. Uh, but but we were just there monitoring and, es- and establishing presence. That was in uh, 1981, 82, and then uh, 1983, 84. On my second two deployments, 1987 and 1989, we uh, participated in tanker escort and flying through the Strait of Hormuz and things like that. And that was uh, pretty exciting back then because uh, U.S. carriers were not going through the Strait of Hormuz. And so just to fly up through the Strait to see Iran, uh, you know, to look out the window, and there it is, you know, look out the the canopy, of course. and you know, occasionally they they would send out a P three or something to uh, to fly around, uh, but but uh, not that much. So I write it up in the um, in the books, and I go into more details about uh, the nature of our operations. For example, we flew uh, twenty four hours uh, for a few days at a time, and that personally was something that I always liked. Uh, you know, you get up at at uh, twelve a.m. or or one a.m. You brief for a flight. It doesn't matter what time it is. You get in your jet, you go flying, come back and land. And, uh, you know, while most of the world is asleep, you're out there flying. In my last deployment, uh, we flew uh, Operation Southern Watch uh, over Iraq. And this was in 1997-98. And so that was a a much, uh, that was a higher level of uh, difficulty and a higher level of interest because Iraq uh, we had already been through Desert Storm. Southern Watch was uh, combat-coded operations, and uh, they were regularly making threats against U.S. airplanes, against the U-2 and all that. And so, you know, we were flying over hostile territory, ready to, uh, or just keeping them under control. Uh, deployments were a lot of fun. We flew over, you know, these remote islands out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, where you think, you know, you're whatever, 1,200, 1,500 miles from anywhere. And we were flying low levels from island to island. And we came across this one island. And there's this beautiful, look like a resort down there. And maybe half a dozen big sailboats in this lagoon. And and we were sitting there going, wow, what is this doing down here? Mm. It's just out in the middle of nowhere, you know? Wow. Some some rich guy probably owns the island. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I did cool. not write the latitude and longitude, so sorry I can't tell you. Ah, mm-hmm. There you go. Okay, so next question: um, Did you love your job as a Rio, and what did you do after you stopped flying on the Tomcats? Uh, I did love my job as a Rio, and uh, something that I tell people, uh, especially if a young person is telling me they're thinking about pursuing aviation <laughs> as a career, I tell them. Uh, definitely do it. I go, it's more, there's more to it than you can imagine. And, and as I said before, I wanted to be a pilot. I couldn't be a pilot. And then when I became a Rio, uh, I discovered, you know, this is a great job also. And I thought it suited me well. Uh, another thing I like besides just flying around in the F-14 Tomcat was uh, that we ran the squadron. So we had a day job and, um, you know, sometimes that was a, a pain, maybe a little bit too much paperwork and stuff, but it, it helped, you know, fill your life. Uh, to get to the point also, when I uh, stopped flying, uh, f- when I was in the Navy, I did uh, staff jobs for a few years, and that was a few more years than I wanted to, but th- that's the way it goes. And then when I retired, I, uh, I wanted to do something fairly differently, and I ended up being an uh, information technology IT program manager for a few years. And then I said, you know what, Uh, I think I'll leverage my Navy experience. So I became a defense contractor, which is uh, like a staff officer. You're still doing that, correct? 
I am still doing that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Roger. Okay, very good. Uh, right, this one. This one's a real meaty question. So, uh, is the Tomcat very maneuverable? And why was it put up against, in training, small fighters like the A4 Skyhawk, F5 Tiger, T38? Uh, where were the real heavy... Uh, whereas the real opposition fighters should have been the heavy fight, heavy Soviet fighters? That is a, a fantastic question, and I will remind people that uh, when we are discussing the Tomcat now, it first flew 50 years ago. Mm. Uh, its first test flight was in December 1970, as I recall, and uh, I think that's right. Aaron, you can check me on that or whatever. Yeah. But the when the December, Tomcat first... When the Tomcat... For, what's that? 21 December, I think, from memory. Yeah, 1970. Yep. yep. So... When the Tomcat first flew, uh, and this is going to give me, Cap, this is going to give me a chance to uh, make one of my other points. Many mm -hmm. people say the Tomcat was designed as an interceptor. That's wrong. That's incomplete. The Tomcat had two missions. One, yes, it had to be an interceptor, defend the fleet. But two, it was the Navy's tactical fighter. It replaced the F-4 Phantom, and it incorporated all the lessons in Vietnam that it could possibly incorporate. One is it had... Uh, it was the first American fighter since the Korean War that had 360 degree visibility, it had a huge canopy. Two, it had a built in gun. Three, these big horizontal stabilizers, they provided very good pitch. Then the, uh, the variable geometry wing gave it great maneuverability at low to medium speeds. And the uh, wing lifting surface was supplemented by this tunnel in here and the shape of the fuselage, which provided a lot of lift. All these combined to give the F-14 very good maneuverability. I mean, it was a sensation when it was brand new. The problem now, 50 years later, is that people are thinking about the F-15. Okay, the F-15 came along. It's also a very maneuverable airplane. I know it's got a fantastic combat record. And then newer and lighter fighters and, uh, you know, increases in power plant design, increases in aerodynamics or improvements in power plant design, improvements in aerodynamics. So the Tomcat is no longer a sensation, but still it had that great capability. So that answers the first question, what is the Tomcat maneuverability? Second, why did it train against the A4 and F5? Because one thing that we learned in uh, Vietnam was that that was where U.S. air crews uh, needed the most training in engaged, within visual range, engaged maneuvering. And when those programs were set up, the A-4 and the F-5 were the most maneuverable, dissimilar aircraft that were available. Uh, by the mid-1980s, uh, the Navy and the Air Force was realizing that they no longer simulated the high-end threat. And so, I mean, that's why the Navy bought the F-16N in 1987. And the Navy, and, you know, training to continue to evolve from there. So uh, that answers most of the first question. Now, um, the heavy fighters, uh, that's what is simulated in training now. And that's that started to come along uh, by the late 1980s. We were already training against the uh, the SU-27, the MiG-29, and later variants. So, you know, the Navy got the message, and it did the best it could with uh, the funding that was available. Roger. Excellent answer. And just to add a tiny little bit with our simulator, for a lot of the guys that are watching, this is relevant too. Uh, we've had the Tomcat in our simulator now for, well, getting on for a year and a half. We've got the Bravo model with the good engines, obviously. And um, I must admit, I thought it was going to be pretty much terrible in ACM, in, in a dogfight, in a knife fight. But once guys, and it took about six months, but once guys started to learn to fly properly, this does not include me, unfortunately, but guys that can fly properly, it's turned out to be the premier kinematic fighter well in the world it beats in dts everything f16 f uh eight fa18 the f15 and the and the uh, you know the soviet the russian uh, fighters on uh, on turn rate on turn radius in places 
on climb in a lot of places. It's really turned out the best overall, and it would be the best period if it wasn't obviously for the, the difference in weaponry. Obviously, we've got contemporary helmet-mounted sights and stuff in the other planes that you just cannot beat, however good you are. Uh, but purely kinematically, it's pretty much the best, as long as you have a very good pilot, no fly-by-wire and whatnot. Um, and um, we found that it just shows what a sweet plane that really is, assuming that everything's well, modeled decently. Yeah. And and here's one of the uh, the things that made life hard for a real life F-14 uh, pilot and and Rio like myself. One, I flew F-14 AIDS my uh, mm -hmm. entire career, so we had the original TF-30 engines, which just were barely adequate. Two, most Tomcats kept Phoenix rails, at least the front mm. two Phoenix rails on the belly, and that greatly reduces the aerodynamic value of the uh, of the fuselage so it reduces your lift that that makes it uh, uh, harder you know r mm. reduces your maneuvering performance what could you jettison those um, those gloves sorry the mounts whatever they're called or were they so hard fixed that? could you actually jettison those phoenix mounts oh you could not jettison them no uh, but maintenance the you know the maintenance mm. department they could take them take them off and put them on mm. And, uh, of course, they would if there was a reason. But the problem, every time you do that, uh, you know, you've got to spend a lot of time reconnecting things and troubleshooting and all that. Mm -hmm. And so just as a as a uh, efficiency uh, measure, most squadrons put them on and left them on for most of the time. Mm -hmm. Aaron. Okay. So what was the worst or scariest emergency situation you faced during your career? Well, Aaron, you, you might think it was my ejection, which happened in uh, December 19th, 1981. That's a day I won't forget. Mm -hmm. uh, but that happened so fast uh, that, that it wasn't really uh, that scary. Uh, I, I'll tell you two quick events, and I'll, I'll only mention one because uh, I got together with my pilot and wrote an article about it. Um, and this was when we took off uh, from the ship during the deployment in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And on the cat shot, one of our engines, I think it was the left, yeah, I think it was the left engine, the main shaft failed. So it wasn't just a burner blowout, it was engine failure. And as we're rolling down, the, we're going down the cat, you know, which is like one and three quarter seconds, my pilot glances at the engine tapes and he sees that we've lost one of our engines and and he says and he handles it exactly correctly he kept the nose flatter than normal and he stepped on the rudder to uh to keep us from turning into that engine so that allowed us to fly away but the rest of the flight we had uh, problems with fuel transfer and we ended up coming back to land uh, with just minutes of fuel remaining um, and so that is an article that I wrote about, and it's on uh, the Aviation Geek Club uh, website. Uh, I can bring it on the fights on if you want. Uh, another one that happened to me was later in my career, a few days after I became squadron commander, we lost our, um, our air conditioner turbine, which was, um, I mean, they didn't call it the Ram air turbine, it's called the ECS turbine, Environmental Control System turbine. And the situation with that is when the bearing failed on that many times the turbine could would catch not many times sometimes the turbine would catch fire burn through controls and you're done you can't control the airplane anymore so uh when this pilot and i lost that issue uh, we declared an emergency we diverted to a nearby field and we landed as soon as possible but we uh there was you know it was a tense 15 20 minutes until we got on deck and thinking, are we going to have to eject out of this? And I wrote about that in uh, in Tomcat Rio, the new book. Roger, cool. very good. Yes, hey, you've had some seriously scary, uh, some scary things. This, mm. you, you know, Cap. One thing that I want to always that I, you know, I've had a thousand or more F fourteen flights in my career, and ninety nine percent of them or more were. No drama. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Right. Um, getting into some numbers now. 
In terms of time frame, how long does it take from getting into the jet and then from taking off uh, on the carrier in a normal scenario? And then if it was a hot situation, you had to scramble to intercept some MiG-28s. Uh, how fast <laughs> could you do it then? And could you, you know, skip some steps and or, or do them later in a flight or something like that? Okay. Uh, the normal, the normal uh, man up and start up, uh, when we did that on a regular basis, um, we would usually walk out from the uh, ready room about, in my, my recollection, is about 35 to 40 minutes before scheduled takeoff. 35 to 40 minutes. And that was both ashore and on the ship. I think we did it mm -hmm. about the same. Um, and the reason is that allowed us time to do a pre-flight and a careful pre-flight took about 10 minutes and then it allowed you to get in and start up and deal, you know, a little bit of comfort time to deal with any, uh, any issues. If you had to restart something, if they had to do a little troubleshooting or whatever. So, so it was, uh, it took a long time, but it allowed you a lot of flexibility. Um, now in terms of an alert, so if you, if you really were in a hurry, and you, you know, it's like, like you said, defend against incoming raiders. Uh, you could, you could easily run out of the ready room, do a very quick pre-flight, and say, okay, I think we got everything, and be airborne. In uh, if the startup and everything went fine, uh, be airborne in you know 20 minutes from the time you walked out. The biggest, the biggest um, time specific uh, time demand was uh, aligning the inertial navigation system, or INS. That took about seven minutes. And there was no way to speed mm -hmm. that up. Mm -hmm. you, you could go without a full alignment, but then you might have all kinds of other issues with the airplane. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had an alert procedure. And some RIOs are talking about alert seven. I've seen guys talk about that, but my recollection was if the plane was set and the crew was in it, you could be airborne in five minutes. Wow. But that airplane was was uh, specifically set up for that, and it was shut down carefully, and it was not moved. Uh, it was already pre-flighted. It was ready to go. Some places they call it cocked for alert, but we just called it set. And uh, if they said, and the crew remained in the airplane, and they said launch the alert five, you could be airborne in five minutes. Wow, was that? Okay, Evan. Oh, okay. So, um, what were the Rio's responsibilities during air-to-air -air refueling? Um, a lot of this is uh, is the typical crew coordination. That's the answer to so many of these things. Uh, as we approach the basket, the pilot is looking at the the picture. He's looking at the picture of the airplane. He did not look at his refueling probe, which was out to the right of the cockpit. Uh, I believe they could see that in their peripheral vision, but they taught pilots look at everything. And, you know, as you fly in, if you're lined up right, the probe will go in the, the probe will go in the basket. But the Rio is sitting there. And as a Rio, I'm watching the probe and the basket. And I could be saying, you know, up, right, right. The, the difficulty with this is for the time it took me to, to see it, verbalize it, pilot to hear it and react, you know, I might be out of cycle with them. So I kind of had to anticipate. And I also just didn't say that much. Okay. So, uh, oh, and before this, we did the uh, uh, air refueling checklist. I would say, you know, are, are you set up? And he did a, just a couple of things. I did a couple of things. Checklist, up and right, plugged in. While you're plugged in, um, once you're plugged in, you know, I go look around, make sure there's no uh, traffic that's going to affect us. Um, let him fly the plane. He's continuing to fly very close formation. And I'm watching the uh, totalizer, but the pilot's also glancing down at that. And, uh, you know, that's it. Just, uh, just monitoring the situation and then you back out and get on with your mission. So, so during refueling, the Rio didn't do that much. All right, back to you, Cap. 
Roger, I mean, again, from simulation's point of view, and I'm not the world's best refueler, but the one thing that I really struggle with is when I'm refueling, people trying to talk to me. Either my Rio or someone else in the flight. I'm like, shut up, I'm really concentrating here. <laughs> okay, you want me to tell you a story? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're here for. Mm. Okay, when I was a Top Gun instructor, uh, and we were flying, I would fly in the F5F, and I had flight controls in the back. And so a lot of times after we would con complete the training mission, we were returning to Miramar, the pilot would say, you know, Bio, you want to fly some? So I would, I'd go, yeah. And so I'm flying, uh, I'm navigating, I'm trying to maintain altitude and watching airspeed. And Cap, just like you, it took all of my <laughs> concentration. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And what I found myself doing was, as we were approaching our check-in point for San Diego, San Diego approach control, I would be pulling the throttle back, slowing down to, to make things mm -hmm. slow down so I could give myself more time. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and you know, especially because I had to talk to the controller and I'm going like, oh, I've got to do all this stuff, you know, within these mileage markers and all that. Well, then later, once I got better, I found myself flying in at a regular airspeed, and you'll be able to you'll be able to process all that one day, one day. if you keep practicing. <laughs> one day, indeed, we'll see. Okay, excellent. Right, that's my question next. Now, this one's about air to ground. Now, my understanding, and I may have this wrong, I thought the A version of the Tomcat was not air to ground capable. Have I completely got that wrong? Completely wrong. Sorry. Oh, whoops. I thought that was the idea of the B. They had got new engines and air to ground. Right, well, scratch whatever I think. I'm usually wrong. What do Rios or Tomcat pilots say when they drop a bomb? Is it shack or pickle or something else? Okay. Uh, you know, I looked at this question when it came in, and I, uh, I'm thinking back. I I don't... They, it would not be shack, because shack is what you say... Mm. When it hits the target, and I believe that came from uh, hitting a shack target or something mm -hmm. like that. I, you know, I mean that's an old, old term. Um, so when you're when you are doing air to ground, you're in a dive angle, and you're and the uh, the Rio is backing the pilot up on dive angle and airspeed. The pilot is tracking dive angle. Oh, and and altitude. The pilot's tracking dive angle, airspeed, altitude, and also sight picture. And, you know, uh, you say uh, standby, mark, pull. I don't think the pilot said anything when he when he pushed the uh, pickle button. Mondra. Interesting. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Right. But you could, there was no doubt that something came off the airplane. Because it thumped it, or something. Oh yeah, and it was you feel it in your feet on, on the floor because the char because the bombs are carried right down here, right below you know the cockpit, and it felt like a large object wrapping the feet under your floor, wrapping the floor under your feet. Watch out! You said charge. The Is this thing when it, what? You said charge. So are you implying that there was some kind of explosive charge in dropping the bomb, or have I misread that completely? No, you're exactly correct. Uh, bombs and uh, Phoenix wow. and Sparrows, uh, they all have explosive charges to blow them away from the airplane with positive separation. And the reason is the plane can be in you know a certain mm -hmm. amount of maneuvering and the missile will still be blown clear of the airplane. The Sidewinder did not have an explosive charge because it flew off the rail. Interesting. I that's the, literally the other thought, ones had explosive charges. For, I didn't know that all these years, and I didn't know that. That's amazing, isn't it? Right. Another thing learnt. Okay. Mm. Uh, that was mine, Aaron. Okay. So this question, you, you probably already kind of answered it, but I'd be interested to see if you've got another take on it. So the F-14 is regarded as one of the best Navy fighters of all time. Can you explain to us from the Rio's perspective what were the combination of features that made the platform so successful? and such a formidable opponent for opposing forces. Yes, uh, let's start with um, uh, some, one thing that you may not think about. It had a large fuel capacity for the time, 16,000 pounds internal. We, we dealt with fuel in pounds most of the time and another 4,000 in tanks. So it gave it 20,000 pounds of uh, fuel. That was big for American fighters. 
Uh, then combining this, the uh, engines had, uh, even the TF30s, had a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, fuel burn rate. If you were at a very conservative fuel burn rate, you could burn, you could fly for, uh, you know, several hours, um, four hours, really. We never did that without refueling, but if, and, and you'd be very low on fuel at the end of that time. But theoretically, I mean, you could fly for several hours. Or, of course, it had the ability to uh, go to full afterburner and had a high top speed. So that's a pretty broad spectrum of performance. So that's the fuel in the engines. Uh, the weapon system was versatile. It went from, you know, very long range for a fighter down to uh, moderately capable dogfight modes. Uh, and a dogfight mode of the radar, this was a big thing when the F-14 was made. Uh, they looked at where are the most useful places, uh, you know, where is the air crew going to want the radar to, to point during an engagement? And they made several modes that would make the radar able to, to uh, get a radar lock in that, uh, in that condition. Um, so those are some of the systems. I've already talked about the, um, the uh, vis visibility from the canopy, uh, you know, the huge bubble canopy. Um, and the, the missiles from uh, guns, AIM-7s, AIM-9s, and AIM-54s. Uh, and then, as I said also, maneuverability. All these things made it a, uh, a good airplane. One of the best, certainly. You, you can't find a better looking plane, I've got to say that. Agreed. So, um, yeah. so something you didn't mention there, Bio, I might just tack this on. Um, I think you would have experienced this. So towards the later part of the Tomcat's career, it became the Bombcat, essentially. So when you were doing um, air to ground, you know, like adding the, the lantern pod on, did you have any involvement with that? And how did that sort of figure into that, that functionality as well? Well, okay, so that's a good point also. It was versatile, yes. Later in my career, uh, on, during my last deployment, I flew a, uh, or we, we operated a lantern pod during those Southern Watch uh, missions over Iraq. And uh, I got to tell you, I was a, you know, I was a senior guy in the squadron because I was a squadron commander. Um, I had never flown air to ground before. And I operated the lantern pod after just a few minutes of, uh, of practice on the ground and a, uh, a warm up flight in the air. And then I was qualified. I still had to have my tapes looked at and debriefed. Uh, and I learned a couple of lessons, but uh, it was uh, it was a well designed, well designed, and very capable targeting pod. And not only that, but the the F fourteen had a large display, either the the T T I D or the P T I D. Uh, so we had a very good display of the image from the pod. Uh, and that combination gave us, uh, you know, a very good capability as a strike fighter. Uh, you know, when, when I was answering this question, I did an online article in the uh, Hush Kit website. And uh, I actually consulted with a couple of other F-14 guys, a Rio and a couple of pilots, just to make sure I didn't forget anything. And uh, so if you go to Hush Kit and you look for, you know, Baronic F-14 or something like that, you'll see a pretty thorough list of, of reasons why the F-14 is, is good. Cool. Back to you, Cap. Roger, 25. Now, this is an interesting, well, it's a different one, and I'm not sure you've actually got an answer for this, but let's see. What would be your advice to your younger self if instead of enrolling as an actual aviator, you had to settle for DCS, our simulator, but still wanted to get good at flying in a jet fighter in simulated air combat? So, Cap, what do you think that means? Do you think that means... So, it means if for some reason it, you couldn't have been a real aviator, let's say you've got, you know, a heart problem or something, and instead um, instead, you had to only be uh, a virtual pilot like me. I couldn't have been a pilot because I've got too many problems. I had to uh, do the next best thing. I had to be a virtual pilot. And have you got any advice for this person who can only be a virtual pilot? I would say follow the uh, not only the Top Gun model, but the, the model of any uh, conscientious training program. Um, evaluate your own performance to the extent possible. Uh, be introspective, 
think back on your flights. This is something that I actually did when I was in Pensacola. They gave us uh, long grade sheets. I've got a, you know, I've got a picture of a grade sheet in this book. Uh, it's long and, and <laughs> distinguished. You know, it was a, it was a very <laughs> thorough... Mm, I know what you're referring to there. <laughs> it's a very thorough grade sheet, had many blocks. Uh, but in addition to that, I got myself a little notebook and I would write some notes at the end of almost every flight. So I would self-critique. And in a di that helped me to internalize uh, and, and to see, you know, am I making the same mistakes and stuff like that. So, so I, uh, to give you the short answer, try, you know, try to improve. Uh, critique yourself. If you can record your uh, flights, go back and look at them. Don't make ex excuses for yourself. If you make excuses, you're not trying to get better. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, don't beat yourself up. And sometimes in my little notebook, uh, I wrote, you know, this went well. Just like in our grade sheets, they sometimes gave us above averages. So, you know, you got a little reward if you did well. So uh, examine, examine your own performance. If you can get a friend to, uh, if you fly with somebody, um, then do a critique session at the end. And be sure to include both goods and others. Goods are things that went well. Others that are things that need to be improved. Roger. Yeah. Well, we put no excuse as well. As virtual pilots, every one of our uh, flight data is automatically recorded, and we can review it with an amazing tool called TACView. It's like the modern version of you were talking about ACMI uh, in the oh, yeah. 70s, I think you were. This is like the modern version. It's it's either very cheap or free. You can get a free version of it, and you can just go and watch your flight for free and all of the metrics you could ever want. So there's no reason yeah. not to self critique like that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've watched I've watched some engagements in tech view. Mm. Uh, another one I would add is RTFM. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so particularly when trying to learn something as complicated as flying a fighter jet. <laughs> yes, yes. Some so, experience with that. Okay. Yeah. Aaron. RTFM. All right. So if you leave an engagement, don't go back in. Why is that? And can you tell us a bit more from personal experience? You know, that was a, uh, that's a title of an article that I put in on uh, Fights On, Aaron, as you know, but if somebody else is watching this and they don't know that, uh, fightson.net. Uh, that was a rule of thumb that we had back in Top Gun in 1982 when I went through as a student. I think the main reason for that rule of thumb uh, one, I didn't spend a lot of time asking them why. I, I mean, out for that one. And I, I think the main reason was, you know, if you, when you leave an engagement, there's a specific reason why you're leaving. You've accomplished your mission. You've reached a point of danger where you're going to, you know, lose yourself and or your aircraft uh, without furthering the mission. Um, or something like that, or you're you're or you're out of weapons. So that's those are reasons why you sh when you leave an engagement, don't go back in. Uh, this came up because when I was going through Top Gun as a uh, student, my pilot and I, uh, who we we worked very hard to do well, we worked well together, and we actually we both ended up going back to be instructors. But we were in a uh, a big fur ball out over the ocean. It was a four V unknown, and there had to be. 10 airplanes out there, you know, we, so we, there was four fighters and there were probably at least six uh, bandits. We get in, we take a couple of shots, we leave. And he goes, uh, Hey, bio, you want to go back in or you want to stick our nose back in? I go, yeah, sure. This was like the last week of the Top Gun class. And we're going, you know, this isn't going to last much longer. We better get all we can. So he did like a uh, six and a half G turn, turn back in. I went to pulse search on the radar. Uh, I locked up a guy. He goes, oh, that's an F-14. Broke the lock, locked the other guy. He took a shot, and then we left that time. I, I wrote it up in the uh, on the website. That's awesome. It's one of the hard-learned uh, things that I've had to learn the hard way is exactly that. Don't go back into engagement. Go into your verbal. Do your, you know, while you've got the initiative, use that up, and then when it's time to exit, exit. In a, in a game or a simulator where, you know, you can't die per se, it's very tempting to say, oh, I want to go play again and jump in. And every time you do that, you get shot down. 
because you've lost whatever it, you. and so it's one hard learned thing to to, to 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 leave it and go home and that's always the right thing to do which is strange but just reinforced by what you said there and plus in the real world the navy doesn't really like you losing their 30 million dollar really. plane and killing two two valuable aviators mm. just because your ego got a little bit challenged and you decided <laughs> to go go and have another shot you know aaron for part of my career or when i was instructor at top gun i was i don't I was a uh, an instructor in the FAST program, and FAST was Fleet Air Superiority Training. It was uh, not part of the Top Gun class, but it was run by the Top Gun Squadron. It was a week of lectures and simulators, and the simulators involved F-14s. They were they were very uh, complex simulators. Uh, they were realistic. You're sitting in an actual F-14 cockpit in a dome with visual projection. And it was uh, defending the carrier from a large raid by Soviet bombers. And often in the debriefs, I would talk to the guys about, uh, you know, when, you know, why did you, why didn't you stop? Or when do you give up? Stuff like that. You, you know, you go out there, you, you do your radar prosecution, you launch your missiles. And what do you do? And, and some guys would go, you know, this is... Uh, fight to the death, sacrifice yourself for the carrier, whatever. And I go, well, you know, that, that looks, that sounds good in Hollywood. Maybe once in a, in a hundred, that's going to be, make sense. But just think about it. If we've got a bunch of F-14 guys out there and they all sacrifice themselves, we're not going to have anybody to, to uh, respond to the next wave. So the Navy needs you to do your mission and bring your airplane back. So, it, you know, it's up to you to manage the risk, get the job done, and bring that plane back. More job. Very good. Okay, uh, we're going to delve a tiny, we're going to dip a toe into politics here. Uh, I'm sure you knew it was coming. Was <laughs> the F-14 fleet retired prematurely in order to rush the newer models like the F-A-18? And do you think that... If the U.S. Navy was to operate the Tomcat to this day, it would have stayed adequate to the modern warfare situation. The the only going in condition is uh, if the Navy had put as much money and effort into F-14 update as it did into the conversion of the Hornet to the Super Hornet. Mm. Okay, so that's a given. We're not even talking about F-14Ds. We're talking about you know, F-14Es or whatever Super Tomcat would have been called, just like a Super Hornet. Because clearly the F-14A, certainly, and even the B and D, they were obsolete, you know, or would be obsolete by now, or, or they're getting there, okay? Still a threat. I know Iran operates them. You can't overlook them, but they're darn old. Was it retired prematurely? You know, I, there's, there's a lot of strong feelings in the United States about this. Uh, and I'm, I don't want to even say any more about it. It was a decision that was made and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> sure is nice to think of, of, uh, of an evolved F-14 though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aaron. Okay. Um, so this one is, uh, did you serve on the later D model and already, does that mean old ones? Older, yeah, the older caps? probably. Ah, uh, okay. Did you serve on the later D model and the older ones as well? And if so, can you tell us what was the difference considering the workload on you? Uh, all of my uh, flying was in the F-14A. I had a few flights uh, in the RAG and the F-14B, but it had the AUG-9. So I've, but I have talked to uh, Rios that flew in the uh, F-14D and also in the Super Hornet. And they say that uh, the sensor capability, radar processing, sensor fusion, uh, data links, all kinds of things like that gave the Rio much more information and actually reduced his time that he had to spend tweaking the radar and changing modes and stuff. Uh, so that freed up uh, brain space. Was, was the way one guy put it. And it allowed him to, uh, to spend more time thinking about the big picture. 
Uh, I've talked about this a little bit. Uh, when I was a, a young Rio, a lot of effort or a lot of emphasis was put on being able to use pulse search over land, which was very operator intensive. And it's kind of because, you know, that's, that's what we got from the Phantom. Uh, they had a, a you know, v operator intensive radar and we guys were acting like this was a super Phantom to some extent. And so the Rio's spend a lot of time tweaking the scope. There was, you know, pulse, pulse video, pulse gain, other knobs like that. So if you take that out of the equation, he's got a lot of time. And he's, you know, if he's a good Rio, he's not going to be sitting back there daydreaming. <laughs> he's going to use that to, uh, to be more lethal. Roger. Excellent. So that's that's automation pushing things through. Uh, Twenty nine. Do you remember your last flight in the big, big girl, and where was it? Did you know that it was your last flight? That's a good question. My uh, my first squadron and my second squadron. I didn't really know when I had my last flight, so there was no big final flight, champagne, wedding down, or anything like that. And that was because my orders had been delayed and then they suddenly came in and they said, okay, you can transfer today. And I just go like, okay, fine, you know, whatever. But at, at Top Gun, I had a, a last flight uh, and, and we had champagne on the flight line. And there's, a, I think, a photo of that in Top Gun days. And then my last F-14 flight uh, was when I was a squadron commander. It was in Oceana in 1998. And I definitely knew it was my last flight. And when I came back, um, uh, most of the air crews were out there with uh, fire extinguishers and buckets of water to uh, wet me down. And very thoughtfully, they had uh, called my wife, invited her over and escorted her out to the flight line. So she got to watch me uh, get wet down. And then we all drank uh, champagne. Or I drank champagne. Everybody else had to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Okay, uh, Aaron. <laughs> all right. So what were your th thoughts the first time you saw the Tomcat in flesh and you climbed into it? First thought, man, this thing is big. Uh, probably second thought, it looks like a damn spaceship because, you know, when you walk up to it, probably the wings were swept, but you walk up, it's all pointed, it sits up tall. And we've been flying these white and gray, white and orange airplanes down in Pensacola, small trainer jets, and you walk up to a Tomcat and it's like, God, look at that machine. Uh, and then one day, one of my friends and I, went out there and climbed up on the plane and walked around on top of it. You know, and we're standing there on top of it. We go, holy shit, what have we gotten into? Um, so probably the size and the futuristics of it in 1980. That's when I first saw a Tomcat and uh, it was pretty impressive. I, I remember on the, um, the live stream we did back in May, um, the uh, uh, the Speed and Angels guys. Um, one of the guys described the Tomcat. He said it, when he looked in the wind, the, the mirrors. He said it was like a flying tennis court behind him. <laughs> that was an interesting description. Oh yeah, it's huge. So, all right, back to you, Cap. Very good. Um, we do we do some rather silly takeoffs in our simulator because it's a simulator and we can be silly if we like. And sometimes we put everyone on the runway at once and we're going to take off in a big formation to see what happens. And and that's a chance when you get to literally, which you just can't do in real life, you get to have a F-14 or a bunch of them literally right next to, you know, a MiG-15 or a old F-86 or something. And the size difference is hysterical how big that thing is and so how small some other other things you don't you know just don't get to see it in other ways do you cap um, cap i've looked at some of your videos and yeah, it, it's great to see you guys having fun i mean you take it seriously but you have fun when you can so absolutely okay um right is it true that some missions were stretched out up to over six hours duration and how do you and the pilot were able to physically cope with that uh, the um, yes, the answer is yes. Most of my missions during my first deployment were right around two hours. Uh, during and then um, as we got into more contingency operations and then later Southern Watch, it was the average was more like uh, three hours or whatever. I I've got, mm -hmm. uh, but but to get an average of three hours, some of them are only an hour and a half, and others are four hours or longer. My longest mission was just over seven hours. 
um, which I've talked about. Okay, so, excuse me, the, uh, the first thing about coping physically is be young. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're a young guy or woman, you can deal with all that stuff. The uh, second thing is uh, carry snacks and, and carry water. And I think all aviators carry water in terms of a, uh, you know, a survival mm -hmm. canteen or stuff like that. And if you're up there for a long time, you need to drink that water. Uh, otherwise, you'll dehydrate in the, in the conditioned air. So what happens after you drink water? Maybe. Okay. And I read <laughs> this question ahead of time, and I came prepared. This is called a piddle pack. <laughs> Yay. I was glad you did this. <laughs> I will not demonstrate it. This is, I believe there's a different one for uh, women. Uh, I would, I'm not sure. It's got a sponge in a plastic bag. <clears throat> On my longest flight, I was thankful that I had uh, a couple of those with me. <laughs> anyway, you just, you know, urinate into that and uh, fold it over and and you're good to go. More jar. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to pass it over to Erin now. Just a word of warning. A lot of our viewers are not native English speakers. So some of the words will be spelt, spelt wrong. So you just need to kind of bounce over it and uh, do the best you can. Erin. So, and this may apply to this one. What was the feeling like to jump off, off the catapult yeah. in that massive jet? And I assume it meant catapult yeah, out of the yeah. plane. Yeah. It was amazing because when you say massive, I'm not sure if you know how much it weighs, but uh, during normal fleet carrier operations, an F-14 would weigh 42, 62, 65,000 pounds, uh, Lord, you know, more than 30 tons. And that was just normal. You could easily go to, or you could go to 70 or whatever. There's, you know, there was a maximum, but just thinking about that weight, more than 30 tons goes from zero airspeed to 150 miles an hour in, in about two seconds. And when that catapult fires, it is like, you know, there's no hesitation or anything. It's just like a steady stream of energy flinging you off the flight deck. Uh, so what was it like? It was uh, impressive, brain rattling, et cetera. And during the daytime for the rest of my career, um, you, can, you have good peripheral vision, even though it's kind of a jarring ride. You have good peripheral vision and you can see the horizon and all that so you can you know, go down the catapult and you can sense that you're doing fine. But at night, it's pitch black. And, and you know, I would go for a, a couple of seconds and then I'd go, okay, I guess I'm still alive. So <laughs> I, guess, I guess that one worked. <laughs> oh, it's also amazing to think about the physics of the, the you know, the forces involved of moving yeah. 30, 30 odd tons into that speed. It's amazing the yeah. job that the engineers did and, you know, to do that. Okay, um, my question 34. In a situation where the jet becomes inoperable and you need to eject, um, is the sequence that the pilot is the first one to call or can the Rio initiate the ejection? What's the, what's the etiquette, if that, maybe that's the word? The etiquette. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'll, I'll, kinda, kinda, I'll try to kind of go through this quickly. Um, Sometimes, or, or I guess often the pilot would, would say eject, 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 or eject, or excuse me, when it's required. So not often, but when it's required, uh, the pilot may call it. Uh, and the reason is he's got more flight instruments, a lot more engine instruments, et cetera, and he's got, you know, the view out front. But um, in the F-14, there were uh, several conditions. If the pilot ever ejected himself, ever, the Rio always went first and then the pilot went, okay? So if the Rio ejected, it depended on the position of a lever that was in the uh, rear cockpit. The lever could be positioned so that the Rio would eject himself only, but most fleet guys, most of the time, flew with it so that if the Rio ejected, he would go and then the pilot would go a half second later. 
So does that answer all your questions? That's, that's really it's interesting. Command eject. Command eject. Yeah, okay, we, have, we, we have that there. We have that as well. Now, the interesting thing, again, different to us, because ours is a game simulator. You don't die and so on. But um, the interesting thing we have with the Tomcat is that the very often the Rio is the one that commands the ejection and commands you know both guys out and he's the one that actually saves them because with the pilot they tend to um in in dts at least tend to try and fight the plane all the way down so you've got an engine problem or something they try and fight keep it airborne all the way down and you know the last thing on their mind is ejecting they just want to save it and it's actually the rio that has the foresight to pull the, the, the cord, if you like, for both of them and actually saves them. Um, that's oh. probably not going to be a thing in real life because obviously you're going to be... No, more... that's, no, no, no. Cap, you're right. In, in, and I'm thinking back about ejections that I'm familiar with. In many cases, the Rio actually pulled the handle. Mm, interesting. But, but in a lot of cases, sometimes the pilot will call eject, eject, knowing that the Rio is going to eject, mm. is, is going to pull the handle. Um, while the pilot's still trying to fly the plane, and then he'll be, you know, taken out mm -hmm. as soon, right after he says that. Interesting. So well, what's, the, go. I was going to say, what's the what's the reasoning behind that half second delay when they go off? Oh, uh, air crew separation. Yeah. One is uh, that the um, so the canopy comes off. There's a four tenths of a second delay. The Rio comes out and goes slightly to the right. And then a half second later, the pilot comes out and goes slightly to the left. Roger. Interesting. Yeah, you don't want them hitting each other and connecting together. No. The only yeah. slight problem I see there is that uh, my understanding of an ejection is that as well as pulling the lever, you have to have your body in a certain position, where is, for instance, if a Rio commanded the ejection and the pilot wasn't ready and his head was kind of off to the side or something trying to save the plane, it can cause him injury. But I guess injury is better than no ejection at all, right? Okay, so that's that's true. They do tell you to get in the proper body position. But when I ejected, uh, we were coming aboard the ship. It was, you know, a very quick decision. I did not feel like I had time to get mm. in the position. Mm. I was grasping the handle, and then the pilot said eject, and I pulled the handle, and I didn't have time to think about sitting mm -hmm. up. So I found myself, during the ejection, I felt like my head was being pushed down. But... Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't lift, lift it, and I didn't feel any pain. So I go, okay, it's pushed down, but, but that's not that bad. Uh, the pilot was flying the plane. Oh, and then he started to pull his, his – he uh, started to reach for the upper handle, and then his seat fired. So he wasn't in good body position either. Mm. But, and he fractured a vertebrae in his neck, but, mm. but it healed in uh, a couple of weeks. Mm. I so, guess there's always going to be that risk of an injection. Even if you prepare, there's always a risk of someone breaking something. Uh, yeah, 20 G's or whatever on earth it is. Okay, Evan, please. Right. So um, the next question, I think you've actually already answered it, so I might just mm -hmm. jump ahead to the one after yep. that, if that's mm -hmm. all right. That's good. So what was the drive behind coming a naval, becoming a naval flight officer, and was this your goal to start with? I think I think I answered that in the uh, in the introduction that we did uh, at the start when I said I wanted to be a fighter pilot, and my eyesight went bad. You remember that? Yep. 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 We have done okay. that. Okay, that was an easy right. one. Uh, yeah. The next one. Well, and I want to keep these moving because I love these questions, but we're kind of getting into a long... Roger. Uh... Okay, the next one's super, super good. Uh, this is operational. What were your rules of engagement at the times of your operation? So I guess you're going to have to pick a period, period of operation, probably the spiciest one. And were those rules of engagement always followed or did people have to improvise? Uh, the rules of engagement did change. I remember... Uh, the uh, at battle group admiral coming in to uh, brief us when we were doing the uh, tanker escort operations, Ernest Will off Iran in 1987. And uh, he's a former attack pilot and a former uh, Blue Angel. And so he's a, a tactical guy. He was he's very sharp. And he said, uh, look, you guys, he goes, you know, we, we had all been briefed on the rules of engagement, but he goes, um, you know, I don't want you to lose the airplane because you're afraid of of breaking mm -hmm. the rules. So he goes, use your best judgment and I'll back you up. Uh, and this was all in terms of uh, absorbing the first shot or being in a threatening situation or whatever. Uh, it, it's really a, potentially a tough call 
you know, and, and at that time, uh, no Iranian fighters came out and challenged us. Mm. Um, later over Iraq, the, I was there for Southern Watch, I'm thinking, and the situation was different. The Iraqi Air Force wasn't allowed to break this line in the air. And so all they had to do was cross a line and we could shoot at them. Mm. But they didn't cross the line while I was there either. Uh, so, so then, so those are some of the, you know, how does it start? Um, it goes without saying that if someone shoots at you, you can shoot back at them. You know, that's, that's always, but, but I was just telling you some of the situations where it's a little bit gray, you know, but you can shoot. Watch out. Um, Aaron. Okay. So what did you take or with you or gain from after completing the Top Gun training? The Top Gun training was intended to train, uh, to train training officers. And um, I think I learned uh, some about that, but, but when I went through as a student, I'm going to just have to admit um, – it didn't turn me into a, a super training officer, I don't think. I think my biggest gain was uh, the experience, the experience of flying five weeks in the Top Gun class and then going back to the uh, squadron and being able to uh, brief and lead flights more, more professionally. So even as a, uh, as a Rio, I could be a, a, f a mission commander. I mean, the, there's still a, a formation lead who's the pilot in the number one airplane, but I could be a mission commander. Um, and I would have to plan and brief, lead the flight and then debrief. Um, so, you know, I would like to give you the, the, uh, the institutional answer, but I'm giving you the true fact. And that is, uh, I, I got a lot of benefit out of it, but maybe not as much as intended. And once again, I'm going to contrast with the way the Navy changed the Top Gun program starting in the 1990s. They made the program more challenging, more demanding, and they used program graduates more effectively. Okay. Cool. Well done. Thank you. Um, next one. Again, really interesting question. Very, Constant Peg. Very, very, very quick bit of history. Constant Peg was a operation where USAF took... Uh, Soviet opposition fighters from the 50s all the way up to the 90s and uh, acquired them from around the world and then had the USAF fighters practice against them rather than practicing against A4s and F5s and stuff. They get to practice against real fulcrums and real MiG-21s and stuff. Did you have any experience of that bio or was that just uh, you just didn't go near that? Well, I'm not going to talk about it uh, because uh, but I will ah. say that. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, this is one of the books I've got yeah. it right here on my bookshelf. Red Eagles, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say. Okay, fine. Your your lips are sealed. Lips are sealed on that one. <laughs> yeah. That's a shame. I'm going to get that out of someone. I'm going to get it out of someone. Right, Aaron, can you read the next read, one? Read those. Read those books. Those yes, are sir. great books. Red Absolutely. Eagles yeah. and uh, America's Secret MiG Squadron by uh, Gail Peck, who the man himself. Roger. Okay. Thank you. So my question is, in the furball, uh, with a number of jets involved from both sides, how do you avoid blue-on-blue -blue situations, and is it down to good communication skills or something else? Well, here, when you're flying F-14s against F-5s ah. yeah. and, and A-4s, it was pretty easy because uh, just because of visual signature of the airplanes. But I'll tell you that believe it or not when the f-18 came along the plan form of the f-18 the wing looks somewhat similar to the f-5 and so at a distance uh it took just a second to uh, to to identify is that an f-5 or an f-18 and then later um when Top Gun started flying both blue air and red air, so there are Top Gun instructors in F-14s and F-18s flying against. Uh, yeah, anyway, I don't know how they avoided blue on blue. I, I never had to do that. I was always, I was always flying a fighter or a bandit, 
and the uh, the other side was a different airplane than I was flying. Um, but in terms of multiple airplanes and managing everyone's location, a lot of it's good location, or excuse good good communication and situational awareness. Uh, and the Rio, one of his main jobs besides defensive lookout is keeping track of the wingman. And so if the if my pilot is attacking somebody, and when I say I mean prosecuting, you know, maneuvering, focused on uh, getting into offensive position, he may go, you know, where's where's uh, Moon or where's whatever, and I've got to go, oh, you know, right five low. He's doing good. That's you know, more John. Okay. Uh, again, another interesting insight that uh, you found difficulty in telling between an F-5 and an F-18 because I have exactly silhouette. I cannot take the, still can't tell the difference between an F-5 and an F-18. Only when they're rolled over, when you can see the dual fin, can you. But if they're in an aspect where you can't see the dual fin, it's like, guys, I don't know if that's a MiG-28 or a friendly or a friendly F-18. So it's interesting. The, the Thank same. you. <laughs> uh, right, I'll kind of blast over this one very quickly. Um, it's talking about the starting up, uh, the alignment, as well as general powering up of the of your cockpit as opposed to the pilot's cockpit. Is it all done at the same time as the front uh, front seat area, if you like, or uh, are you still just powering things up in your seat while you're in the air? No, mo most of it was the uh, same time. The uh, pilot would. The pilot would signal the uh, ground crew for uh, electrical power and starter air, whatever the order was. Sorry, I haven't thought about this in a while. You'd get the sense the plane was starting. The Rio would lower the, the uh, canopy. And then the uh, pilot would, I think he usually said, you know, generators or whatever he said. And then the Rio would start the AUG-9. And so then uh, you're doing it at the same time. He's doing a lot of uh, checks with the plane captain. Uh, then you get your hands up um, while you're running the uh, the uh, built-in checks and stuff like that. And then the only thing that you would do is you'd uh, leave the AUG-9 in standby until after the cat shot, and then you turn it on to transmit. Roger, thank so you. So same time. Aaron? Yeah. Okay. This one's a really interesting one. <laughs> um, is it possible, in your opinion, for the Ir Iranian Air Force to maintain the effectiveness of the Tomcats that they have after all these years of scarce parts and replacement modules? Are they still flying the jet just to try and show force, or are those jets still capable fighters? Um, I only know what I read, just like uh, what you guys read, and it appears that they're still capable fighters. Uh, it you know you you can do anything as long as you put enough resources into it and the Iranians have plenty of smart people uh, in terms of engineers technicians and uh, air crews so um, you know th I think their F-14s are could still be viable fighters I mean think about it if if uh, the Australians wanted to keep mirages flying or if the Brits wanted Brits wanted to keep lightnings flying it wouldn't be easy but you could mm. do it. Mm. Well, it's like the look at the B fifty two. It's been flying for what is it sixty odd years, and it's still going strong. So, <laughs> mm. so all right, Cap, back to you. Interesting. I'd, uh, it was a fictional book. It was a well written but fictional book that talked about just what we were talking about there, saying and saying that these fighters are going round, but nothing really works apart from the flight instruments. Not really a lot works on them, but it had no, you know, it wasn't necessarily true. Uh, the next one, I well, Cap. Cap, yeah. it, Cap, if that's the situation, I mean, that's certainly possible. And I haven't looked at, you know, uh, reports of, yes, we're detecting AUG-9 emissions and stuff like that. Mm. I don't I don't know if they're if they're just flying them. I really mm. don't know. Probably be posturing or OK, well, we, we, we yeah. won't uh, we won't guess that. The next one um, I've reread and I don't really understand, but I'm going to punch it out anyway. Were you tasked to observe the rear aspect of the jet where the pilot's view is restricted? Oh, I see. And how did you do that if you had to stay on top of the instruments and the radar? So how did you how did you it's, cover the pilot's blind, blind spot and read the instruments? I read that as. It's time sharing. Mm -hmm. You know, early in the uh, intercept, when you if you're running an intercept um, or if you're on patrol, you spend more of your time looking at the radar you know the scope up here scope down here but and that was something that i wrote in uh, top gun days 
Top Gun still, the Top Gun squadron did not want uh, Rios to be, you know, heads down glued to the radar. So I'm looking for something in here. So this diagram goes over details like that. So, so they would have uh, what they call the wild card. This was the term wild card. They would have a single airplane up high above the fighters. And while the fighters were running the intercept, this guy would roll in from like high five o'clock. And it was up to the Rios to, to share their time to run the radar, run the intercept, and continue to do defensive scan. Uh, so that was a very good, uh, uh, that was a good exercise. And when I went through Top Gun as a student, one reason that diagram is in there is because I remember I saw the wild card. So I was going like, good, I, you know, I did it. Mm. And, uh, but I mean, that, that happened. I wasn't the only one that did it. Um, um, and then as you get closer, as the distance counts down, you start to change your uh, scan. And then inside of certain miles, what we did, and this was back in the old days when it was simpler, I would hand off to the pilot, you know, I'd, I'd get him set up. He would take the uh, management of the uh, airplane. And then I was out most of the time, defensive lookout, watching our wingmen. And, uh, and I would just come in to check the radar uh, once in a while. Roger, excellent. Okay, Aaron. All right, so was the jet shaking and rattling in high alpha and tight turns? And could you tell when she was really stressed by the noise in the feel of the airframe? Okay, so oh, okay, so in high alpha and tight turns, yes. And the, one of the other things was, and I, I remember this, you're sitting here, you're looking out at this wing, and in a tight maneuver, the uh, leading edge slats are down, and the wing is bending and shaking with airplane airframe buffet and you see the spoilers come up when you roll and stuff like that and you're just and i would sit there and i would just marvel at the strength of that thing so so okay i was shaking my head no because during normal flight the plane did not shake and rattle but during uh high alpha and tight turns yes it really did uh there wasn't a lot of noise of the there wasn't a lot of noise. The noise came uh, at higher speed. You could hear the uh, the wind noise over the canopy structure. Cool. Moja, very good. Uh, right, this one. Again, I don't really understand it, but everyone is asking about carrier takeoffs. But I would like to know, what was the approach and the landing like? Uh, what did you feel? Uh, two different situations. One was uh, daytime. During the daytime, uh, you come into the uh, the uh, visual landing is a lot of visual assessment. Uh, there, it, one, your zip lip. There's no radio transmissions at all. Hmm. Uh, this is out in the middle of the ocean. You've got a lot of airplanes. They locate the carrier. <clears throat> they go into their assigned altitude. They visually look if there's, uh, for example, back in the day when there's two F-14 squadrons, we would be we would have two airplanes, and our sister squadron would have two airplanes, and you would have to set up an orbit above the carrier across the circle from them, and you do that all visually. Then you watch the flight deck, and when the deck is ready, you descend out of that orbit and come in, and it's called breaking the deck. You're the first fighter in, and the carrier wanted you to be overhead at the right moment because that means they don't have to spend extra time steaming into the wind waiting for planes to land it's all about um, efficiency of operations and it's the sooner they recover all those airplanes the sooner they can maneuver to do whatever they want because while they're recovering airplanes mm -hmm. they're restricted Okay, so, so there was a lot of judgment and experience, and then there were some visual signals and stuff like that. Uh, and then on the final approach, it's all the pilot flying uh, the ball, um, meatball, lineup, angle of attack, and the Rio backing up him up on airspeed, altitude. The Rio initiated the landing checklist, stuff like that. Nighttime, totally different. You go into a radar controlled holding with a, a, a controller, an approach controller on the ship. He calls you down, uh, tells you when, you know, 
to begin your descent. <clears throat> Again, you're on radar control. And as you go down, you're looking at uh, instruments and numbers. And so uh, for pilots, you know, I mean, I'm a backseater. For pilots, it's very difficult or it's very challenging to fly that night approach and you go to the carrier and it's just a little speck of light and as you get closer it grows but it's it's never big at night it's just you know a little couple of patterns of lights and then you land land on it so in the daytime there's a lot of judgment and at night i thought i felt there was a lot of numbers and and so you know it's just a totally different feel uh in terms of the approach and landing. Roger. Oh, it, just, it gives me shivers just thinking about case three in a Tomcat. In, in the F-18, it's easy. You get a lovely big, because it's a more modern plane, obviously, you get a lovely big display where you can see where the carrier is and you can see where you are and you can see where your buddies are. It almost does it for you. In the F-14, you've got very little of that and that poor old pilot had to do something that was just as complex. The well, Mark we, 1 eyeball. Well, we no, not in case three at night. No, there's nothing. Oh, true, true. Well, I mean, we had we had displays. You know, he had a visual display and stuff. It, mm. it wasn't as good as the F-18s, no. But but you know, he he had a good orientation and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the one more thing that that came to mind after as we were talking is, uh, I remember many times, day and night, um, and I I guess the pilots the same way. You fly that approach until you smash onto the deck, and so I am sitting there the same way. I'm. I'm watching his airspeed. I'm watching altitude, and I, and many times I'd I would be saying you know one knot fast. Oh, <laughs> so I'd be telling him his airspeed is one knot fast, and we'd hit. And I it's not like mm -hmm. okay, you're one knot fast. Okay, we're about to land. Mm -hmm. Here we go. No, you're working, working, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, okay, we're on the deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. You got to have a lot I got of trust. Like Six hundred. 630 or something landings mm. in my career. Okay, Aaron, okay. your go, isn't it? So, yes. Um, uh, was it really true that with the Phoenix, you were out of danger and able to just lock on and blast the opposing force from a safe distance, or was it more complicated? I wish it was that simple. <laughs> <laughs> now, admittedly, back in the early 19, you know, bef before the... Uh, advent of certainly of the even the AA7 or the MiG-23, the Apex, but certainly the AA-10. Um, if you could identify an aircraft as hostile and you're in combat environment, then you can, uh, you know, and you cleared to launch Phoenix, yeah, you could start to either destroy them or certainly disrupt them. You know, if they're looking out and they, they know they're opposing F-14s and they see these contrails rising up in the sky, uh, it's up to the enemy to decide, you know, do I think I'm going to live today or <laughs> that thing is coming at me, I need to turn. So either that's disrupting or destroying. The problem with that is back in those days, we didn't need to use the Phoenix to shoot those airplanes. I mean, and so the, the Navy policy informally was to save the Phoenix to defend the carrier. And, and guys used to make a joke, you know, you don't want to use a million dollar missile to shoot mm -hmm. down a $200,000 MiG-17, but, but that's flawed because that $200,000 MiG-17 has got to be stopped or it can do a lot of damage, you know? So anyway, uh, later, when everybody got a lot smarter about, uh, you know, face shots and forward quarter tactics and all that, it's a lot more complicated to, to shoot a Phoenix, possibility the enemy can maneuver to defeat it. Although the Phoenix could react to maneuvers every, and I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but every time you maneuver, you make the missiles job more hard, uh, more complicated, mm. you know, harder. So. Cool. Yeah. It, sorry, yeah, I just found that fascinating that how you talked about the again the reality is those missiles cost a lot of money and there's politics involved in whether you can use them or not. Again, we just chuck six on. No one cares. You know, we don't have to pay for them. So, so everyone just takes six Mark sixties out with them every time, and that's just blasts them off. But in reality, and this must it just answers one of my question. One of my questions as well is that a lot of real engagements the F-14s. I know there haven't been a vast amount, but real engagements with F-14s 
I think almost all the times they were never carrying phoenixes, which always fascinated me. Why aren't you carrying phoenixes? That's what you're kind of built around. And we talk about it there, one of the reasons why. Uh, really interesting. Um, oh, yeah, but the, the the fighter, I love the fighter loadout. You put four sparrows in this belly, mm -hmm. four sparrows in the belly and four winders on the wing. Oh, that's the way to go. Roger, and a beautiful segue into our next question. Operationally, what was your typical loadout and why? Um, so we were preloaded before we approached the jet, and it was also, it was, uh, the air wing discussed this, you know, at the start of the deployment and at phases of the deployment. So normal or, or often we would carry just uh, one, one, and one. One, and when you say one, one, and one, it's easy. But if you say like two, three, and one, or three, two, and one, there were different, different, uh, um, uh, game plans for sometimes it referred to Fox one, Fox two, Fox three. Okay. Mm -hmm. The order of the, mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the numbers. Yep, yep. Other times it was Phoenix Sparrow Sidewinder, which is different. Oh, so usually when you said the loadout for the F-14s is this, you had to explain, you know, one Phoenix, two Sparrows, two Sidewinders or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, it varied. Uh, a lot of times we would carry, we'd have Phoenix rails on the front. We'd have one Phoenix there. We'd have one Sparrow back here, one Sparrow on a wing, and maybe three Sidewinders. Hmm. So that was in the 1980s. Uh, by the time we, I got into Southern Watch, we were carrying cluster bombs or LGBs on the Phoenix stations here. We carried a Phoenix under the left wing, Sidewinder here, Sparrow here, and a Sidewinder there. So in Southern Watch, the normal air-to-air -air was one Phoenix, one Sparrow, and two Sidewinders. And, and, you know, and loaded gun every time. Who's making the decision? Any idea about who's oh, yeah. about that loadout? Oh, yeah. The, the squadrons would decide that and they would discuss it with the air wing commander and that would be the doctrine. And then if they wanted to change the uh, loadout, for example, uh, they want to carry two Phoenix or they want to download rails, they would just talk to the air wing and, and, um, and change, make the change. But see, on, a, on an aircraft carrier, every airplane is a part of the air wing and that is the combat unit. And so the air wing commander is responsible for, you know, effectiveness. And so he's going to approve any decisions about the airplane configuration. As that's, that was my perception. Oh, Joe. Very good. Okay, Evan. Okay. Do you, did you, well, I'd say, do you miss the Tomcat? And why do you think there are none left to keep as a flying heritage like so many other military planes? Do I miss the Tomcat? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> It's an obvious question, so I'll leave you to answer the next one. <laughs> Aaron, I, I will say that, uh, yes, I miss it, and I just feel very fortunate that uh, that I got to do it and that and that there was a lot more to it than I ever imagined. I mean, to, to flying Tomcats being in a F-14 squadron. In terms of keeping them flying at like a heritage flight, I would just say Navy uh, just doesn't have the budget uh, and also maybe some consideration for uh, keeping parts from Iran. If there was a heritage flight, they'd have to have parts supplies and they'd have to watch them carefully for for people trying to steal some. Mm. Do you want well, to go to the next question yeah. real quick? Yep. Yeah. Go, um, before the F-14 launches, it kneels, so it's the front, front landing gear compressing. Yet when I see some footage of other Navy fighters, like the Phantom, then they'd often raise the front of the uh, front of the plane before the cat shot. Why is this? Okay, I had to look this one up. So I looked in my, uh, in my NATOS manual. Uh, well, let's talk about the other airplanes first. Like the F-4, yes, it jacked up the uh, nose. And the F-5, actually, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't carrier-based, the F-5 mm -hmm. had nose strut mm -hmm. extension. Yep. Uh, and then airplanes like the F-7U Cutlass had a very mm -hmm. high nose up. And all of that is 
part of the, you know, the planning and design of the airplane, they say, okay, what's the airspeed off the end of the catapult? What's the best angle to fly? That's what we want the airplane to be at the end of the catapult. Mm -hmm. So they do whatever it takes to design that, you know, and the Phantom has raised the strut. Mm -hmm. In the F-14, the nose strut compressed. I'm sorry, I don't have operational landing mm -hmm. gear on this model. <laughs> In the F-14, the nose strut did compress. So this person is correct. That's called kneeling. It went down the catapult and at the end, it uncompressed, it extended. Oh. And the NATOPS manual says that is to start to rotate the nose to establish flyaway attitude. <clears throat> now, possibly a, uh, a pilot who looked into this or Rio or a LSO could give you more information, but the manual seems to indicate that uh, it would start some like momentum for nose up. And, and then it says it's to establish a hands-off uh, flyaway attitude. So. <clears throat> wow. Thank you. Another thing learned, because I didn't have the foggiest, I made, I just had a guess that because making it shorter might kind of theoretically make it stronger or something, but obviously it was wrong. So, right, how interesting. It sort of springs it back up there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For 53, who was the best pilot you flew with in terms of BFM. Also, what's your most memorable BFM engagement against an adversary? Well, um, I flew with a lot of good pilots, so there's no way I'm going to throw one guy's name <laughs> Yeah, I because, thought that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Maverick was pretty good, apparently. <laughs> my, you know, my most memorable engagement is written up in here. It's the uh, 1v5 against F4s, but, but I always talk about that one. And so, uh, I mean, I, I, I will tell you about another memorable engagement, and it's one that started out as an intercept, um, and I was flying with Lumpy. And we were doing a 2V unknown intercept. It was early in the morning. It was above the uh, tax range in Arizona. We thought we had everything suitcased, and we're flying along expecting to get to the merge, and then there's this blur. It goes by the canopy. Uh, six and a half G's and and we look and it was an F-16 and we're sitting there going how did that guy get here get in and so Lumpy kept the pressure on that guy we kept it into a uh, a looping fight which was we mm. were doing obliques because mm. even mm. because um, even with Max G and everything we were doing obliques the F-16 was Lumpy, to his credit, kept the pressure on that F-16, so he could not get a shot at mm -hmm. us, and he could not escape. Meanwhile, our wingman realizes that we're engaged, and so he's gone, you know, and Lumpy goes, I'm engaged with an F-16, and so the, our wingman, who started out as a flight lead, he, he goes, you know, I see you, but I don't see the F-16. And Lumpy's going, he's right across the circle from me. It's like, uh, we're fighting this guy, fighting this guy, and and we're waiting for our other F-14 to come in and shoot him and kill him. And uh, it finally happened, but uh, it took a long time. And so I wrote that one up in this book. Awesome. That was a that was a memorable uh, fight. That is cool. Okay, um, Aaron. Okay, so uh, hang on a minute. After decommissioning a VF-24. VF-211 included the VF-24 check on their tails as a tribute to their sister squadron. Why did it go away for a time? Okay. Uh, that decision was made by the CO uh, before my skipper. So when I became the squadron XO, the outgoing CO, he, he had uh, VF-211 had uh, checkerboards on the tails and he added the check to commemorate VF-24 and it actually, though, that was a, a tail design that VF-211 had used back when it flew F-8s also. So there was some historical uh, precedent for that. So then uh, for more than a year, 211 had the uh, checkerboards and the check on the tail. And then when I became CO, uh, and this is, this is, you know, borderline unpleasant, but it's the reality of the squadron. Uh, a few weeks after I became CO, we're on the deployment. I'm the squadron commander. 
I'm walking around to the work centers and just talking to our, uh, our sailors. And I appreciated their very candid comments to me. And one uh, sailor goes, uh, Skipper, why does, uh, why do the VF-24 people get special consideration? And, and uh, I apologize. I hope no VF-24 people are offended by this because it was really a very small number who, who caused this problem. But I said, uh, and I have been in VF-24. I go, what are you talking about? Well, I asked the sailor, why, did he, why does he think they're getting special consideration? He said, well, we have the check mark on the tail and VF-24 people never stand overnight watches and they never do this, and never do that. I go, huh, what do you mean? Well, there were a few VF-24 people who were in positions of responsibility and they were watching out for their former squadron mates, ex-VF-24 people. And so there was like a little click, C-L-I-Q-U-E, of VF-24 people. And, and that was causing a problem because we also had a group of people who had been in VF-111. And of course, we also had a, a bunch of VF-211 people who had been there from you know their first squadron. So I went and I told the maintenance uh, officer, I said, you've got to take the check off the tails. I said, it's, it's sending the wrong message to some of our, uh, our squadron members. So the check came off. And then, uh, then I, I, um, when I left at the end of my CO tour, I think the guy who followed me, he liked the check on the tail. So he had him put it back on. <laughs> so these are just some of the realities of, of working in a large organization like that was are you guys surprised yeah. by that story, or you? I don't yeah, know. I, I didn't know anything about it. I don't know what to think about, but I guess. Um, okay, last one from me. Fifty-five. Did they recreate the ladder with all the kills from a Top Gun graduate at Fallon when they moved to Top Gun? Also, do you have pictures of the whole ladder kill wall? Okay, so uh, this is a great question. Uh, the ladder was the stairwell at, uh, and then in, in the Navy, a ladder is, they call stairs a ladder. Oh. Um, ladder was a stairwell at NAS Miramar, and it had all U.S. Navy MiG kills uh, in the Vietnam War, not only Top Gun graduates. In the, um, in the uh, classroom, they had pictures of every Top Gun class, and those graduates who had MiG kills had a little MIG sil uh, sil mm. uh, symbol above their head on their picture. So when they moved to Fallon, uh, that, that ladder and all the kills were gone. And so as I understand it, um, they put uh, glass blocks. So there's a wall of glass bricks, you know, glass bricks, mm -hmm. architectural, mm -hmm. and they have uh, engravings of uh, kills, Navy MIG kills. And that's how they commemorate that at uh, Fallon. Now, I had to ask uh, Jello, who runs Fighter Pilot Podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to ask Jello about that. And he gave me an answer to this question. So, thank cool. you. Thanks, Jello. Aaron, uh, finish right. us off, please. Last question. <laughs> he, uh, okay, are there really no controls in the Rio cockpit for navigation, such as selecting course, radial, or steering, such as TACAN, DEST, AWL, et cetera? This is the last question. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Rio cockpit has no flight controls. But in terms of navigation, uh, the F 14, you may be surprised, was uh, fairly rudimentary. Our primary long range navigation, well, we had an inertial navigation system, but we also had a TAC in. Uh, and the, uh, the pilot and the Rio had identical TACAN boxes. So either the pilot or the Rio could select the TACAN channel. But the Rio had a, and I think they both had a button that said control. So you could really screw it up if you didn't manage that. And, and I don't think an F-14 did this, but some aircraft have crashed by not knowing uh, which wow. TACAN, you know, or messing that up, or just not being up the right channel. Okay, so the pilot or Rio could operate the TAC in. In terms of destination, AWL, uh, destination was a, uh, 
an odd nine string function, I think this person is, and that was that was in the back seat. The Rio selected destination steering to a waypoint or something like that. Uh, AWL, I think that's all weather landing. That may be a pilot display control. So so the controls were split up um, with the philosophy that the Rio was responsible or it was had the lead responsibility for navigation but also the pilot had certain navigation uh, abilities and requirements and so he could do things uh, up there also right is there anything you uh, to, to end on a bang uh, before i go into my thanks and stuff like that is there any funny stories or anything you want to kind of end with bio you must have something <laughs> in your mind that you've been waiting to to spout out there's so much more to being a rio or a pilot being in a fighter squadron, there's so much more than you can imagine. I mean, I tried to include a lot of this. is not just a not just a pump for my book. Mm. I tried to cover a lot of it in here, uh, but I can't. You know, I can't even begin to tell you right now. You know, rolling into the ready room and uh, and not knowing whether you're going to have a hostile audience or a friendly audience, people giving you grief or people saying, you know, nice job. Um, just. Uh, it's just a very full experience. Uh, the other thing in terms of DCS, I'll give you guys a, a kudos is, you know, I'm glad to see that you're trying to do a good job and also having fun mm -hmm. uh, sometime also, because mm -hmm. we did that too. We had fun, got away with it <laughs> whenever we could. Yeah, no, fine. Okay, right. Well, let's terminate. Valued viewers who are watching, uh, please check out the competition that we linked at the beginning and we will link in the uh, video description. Books, don't forget bios, awesome books, um, uh, new and old, and um, I'm going to be receiving mine soon and I'm looking forward to reading that. Thanks, obviously, to everyone that's put these questions together. It's, 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 I know they're not always the most efficient questions, but they are very interesting having viewer real questions from real people. I like those. those. These are very good questions. Yeah, if it was from me, they would just all be very linear and boring and safe, and it would just get a bit, you know, it's just not worth it. Aaron, thank you. It wouldn't be possible for Aaron to set this up. Bio, obviously, for giving us his time, and anyone else that is involved, um, it's, you know, it's, I shouldn't really say it, but it's got to be our best interview so far. The amount of stuff learned is just crazy. Uh, really good. Any final thoughts from either Aaron or Bio uh, before we uh, cut and sign off? Tomcats forever. Yeah, well, why not? <laughs> why not? And, and look, I, you know, I, I, I want to say, Kat, obviously, thanks to you, Cap, mm -hmm. for having us on the the the, um, the, the channel because. Uh, you know, it's great to get in front of a bigger audience and we know that your DCS people, I mean, Bio and I both like the fact that you guys have a bit of fun and that's yeah. what's always made me, um, the Grim Reapers appeal to me. But mm -hmm. yeah, hope, guys, hope everyone enjoyed it and uh, look forward to seeing you again with maybe another surprise guest soon. Ooh, how tantalizing. Lovely. Okay, guys, thank you and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.